Hello and welcome. My name is Jeff Petroff. I'm vice chair of the New Hanover County Planning Board. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's meeting. I ask that you please turn off or silence all mobile devices. Please sign in if you plan to speak this evening. These meetings are closed captioned for public broadcast. So if you do come to the podium, please speak clearly into the microphone. At this time, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Vafer to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So that all that are able, please stand and face the flag. All right, thank you very much. So the items from tonight's meeting will go forward to the county commissioners meeting scheduled for Tuesday, September 5th, 2023. This meeting will begin at approximately 4 p.m. and will be held in, at this facility in the New Hanover County Historic Courthouse. The planning board representative for the next two planning board meetings will be Pete Avery for August 7th. You, you good? and Mr. Cameron Moore for September 5th. All right, great. So the format for tonight's public hearings is each side has a total of 20 minutes, 15 minutes for presentations, and then five minutes for rebuttal. As a reminder, this board is only an advisory board. The, Court of the Board of Commissioners make the final decision on any of the requests being considered tonight, but public comment tonight can impact our recommendation on what may be ultimately presented to the commissioners. This time I'd like to read the Code of Ethics in accordance with the New Hanover County Board of Commissioners resolution adopting the Code of Conduct, a Code of Ethics as adopted on January 4th, 2016, it is the duty of all county boards and committees to respect and abide by the New Hanover County Code of Ethics in the performance of their duties. More specifically, all planning board members should obey all applicable laws uphold the integrity and independence of the board, avoid impropriety, faithfully perform the duties of the office, and conduct the affairs of the board in an open and public manner. It is the further duty of every board member to avoid conflicts of interest as defined in North Carolina General Statute, Chapter 160D, Section 109. Does any member have a known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board this evening? If so, please identify the conflict and refrain from any undue participation in the particular matter involved. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to move to the approval of the minutes, the June 1st, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to be approved as presented. We have a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Approval of the minutes moves forward. This time I'd like to go to the election of officers and I ask Madam Attorney, will you please take over? Thank you, Mr. Petroff. As you know, every um, August there's a new election of officers. We have to elect a chair and a vice chair. It will be up to you to put up the nomination, second that nomination and, and vote on it. I open the floor to those nominations at this time. I'll make a nomination that we um, elect Jeff Petroff as our chair of the planning board. I'll second that nomination. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Congratulations, Chair Petroff. Thank you, ma'am. For vice chair, I would like to make a motion that we um, elect Colin Tarrant as our vice chair of the planning board. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Congratulations, vice chair. All right. Thank you, Madam Attorney. This time, we'd like to move to our regular agenda items. Actually, before we do that, staff, did, did we want to juggle these around? 
Um, Mr. Vi or Mr. Chair, um, we have received a request for a continuance for the applicant for um, item two. And so if you would like to entertain that request at this time, um, I, I believe uh, Ms. Schaefer is prepared. Yes, let's do that so we're not wasting anyone who came here to speak on, on in favor or against that, that waste their time. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and, and hear your request, Ms. Schaefer. Thank you. Um, this is for the second item on the agenda. It is our first time on the agenda, um, and we would just like to request a continuance to the date certain next meeting. Uh, we still have some issues that, that we're working through um, and had hoped to have them ready, but um, they're not, and so um, we, we would respectfully request a continuance. All right, any board comment or? Is there anybody here in the public here for that particular case? I, I think a couple people had signed up. Okay, just, just wanted to see. Yeah, we're, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, all right, we have a, a request for a continuance to the next month's meeting, is that correct? Yes, sir, please. All right. A September 7th. That would be Yes, that was September 5th, oh, yes, yes, is that, is that correct? Staff, is that correct, the 7th? 7th, okay. I'll make a motion to continue this item till the September 7th planning board meeting. We have a motion, we get a second? Second. second. Motion and second, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion, that request passes, this, that, agenda that will move to the next agenda thank you all right back to the regular agenda items um, this is rezoning map amendment application z23-14 request by west reynolds with sb cottage investments llc applicant to rezone four parcels totaling approximately 7.37 acres of land located at 7641, 7645, and 7647 Carolina Beach Road from R15 residential to CZD R5 residential for a maximum of 56 attached single family dwelling units. This item was continued from the July 6th regular meeting. This is a public hearing. We will hear a presentation from staff and then the applicant and any opponents will each be allowed 15 minutes for their presentation an addition, additional five minutes for rebuttal. This time I'd like to ask staff for their presentation. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. The applicant is requesting to rezone approximately 7.37 acres from the R15 residential district to a conditional R5 residential district for a maximum of 46 dwelling units. This item was continued at the July meeting to allow the applicant to make revisions to the proposed concept plan in response to feedback provided by the board and the public at the July meeting. The site is located at 6641 Carolina Beach Road and was originally zoned R15 in the 1970s. At the time, the purpose of the district was to ensure housing densities remained lower due to the need for private wells and septic systems. Since then, private water and sewer utility service has become available in the area. From the aerial photography, we can see the site is bordered by single-family residential development to the north, east, and south. The western side is bordered by a service road and Carolina Beach Road. Here's an aerial photo of the site with images of the property from different angles. Here are examples of development you might see in the R15 district. And here are examples of development you might see in the R5 district. <clears throat> the proposed concept plan includes 46 attached single family dwelling units in the form of quadruplexes, triplexes, and duplexes. The revised concept plan reduces the number of proposed units by four compared to the previous plan presented in July. In addition to the improvements to the existing unimproved easement, a condition has been included guaranteeing the option for future connectivity to Seabreeze Road to the north. And an additional looped private road has been included to reduce the number of driveway cuts along the road compared to the site you saw in July. Several significant trees have been identified on the property. A condition has been provided to preserve the trees that do not impact essential site improvements. 12 stormwater infiltration basins are proposed throughout the site. This is an increase of eight additional infiltration basins than previously proposed. 
a condition has been included requiring the addition the additional basins if approved. The revised plan also removes the two units from the flood zone to the south and four areas of the property have been delineated as wetlands. The Army Corps of Engineers has confirmed they are considered waters of the state and are not federally regulated. This determination was made before recent changes to the federal definition of wetland. Finally, a 20 foot wide spatial buffer is required along the perimeter of performance residential developments. In some areas of the project boundary, it will parallel existing 20 foot buffers required by those developments when they were built out. There is one approved TIA and three subdivisions currently under construction in the area. The site has full access onto a dead end service road running parallel to Carolina Beach Road. Carolina Beach Road is accessed to the north at the signalized intersection at Seabreeze Road. This slide depicts the estimated trip generation for the site. The proposed development would generate approximately 18 a.m. and 24 p.m. peak hour trips. The estimated traffic generated from the site is under the 100 peak hour threshold that triggers the ordinance requirement for a traffic impact analysis. The project is located along a service road parallel to a major arterial roadway with available capacity in the southern portion of the highway corridor. Access to the service road is near a signalized intersection on Carolina Beach Road, which increases the potential for vehicle conflicts entering the intersection. The local roads do not connect to other parts of the surrounding network and therefore have low daily estimated vehicle counts. The lack of available DOT data indicates the roads do not currently experience heavy enough traffic volumes to warrant monitoring. While there is no specific data available to indicate current or anticipated impacts to roadway capacity, the increase in estimated trips generated by the proposed development is minimal. In addition, the project will be subject to DOT driveway permitting which will include the intersections of the service road, Seabreeze Road, and Carolina Beach Road in their analysis. Based on the current general student generation rate, the potential increase would result in approximately eight additional students than would be generated under current zoning. This generation rate is updated on an annual basis using actual student numbers provided by the school system and provides a county-wide picture of the number of students each new residential unit is likely to yield taking into account that most new residential units in the county do not provide homes for large numbers of school-aged children. Due to the size of the property and access onto Carolina Beach Road, this property is less likely to be developed with lower density detached single family housing. Several environmental areas were identified on the property, including state regulated wetlands, the AE flood hazard area, Bacosan conservation resources, and regulated trees. Additional conditions have been provided for utility service, tree retention, connectivity, and stormwater. The comprehensive plan designates this property as community mixed use, which is intended to promote a mix of retail, office, and residential development at moderate densities up to 15 units per acre and a building height range of one to three stories. A goal of the comprehensive plan is to promote environmentally responsible growth by promoting a mixture of uses where appropriate in an effort to cluster development and minimize impacts on natural resources. The proposed rezoning request is generally consistent with the 2016 comprehensive plan because the proposed density and housing type are in line with the recommendations of the community mixed use place type and the proposed development would act as a, an appropriate transition between the highway and existing detached single family residential development. As a result of the policy guidance of the 2016 comprehensive plan, zoning considerations, and technical review, staff recommends approval of the request with the following conditions related to utilities, tree retention, access to the existing easement, future interconnectivity, and requirements for additional stormwater infrastructure. Staff has received several additional comments regarding this application, which were provided to you earlier today. In addition, I believe you, uh, an email was also sent to the board uh, earlier this week. Should the rezoning be approved, development of the site will be subject to additional development review to ensure all land use regulations are met. This concludes my presentation. Representatives of WMPO and County Engineering are here, and the applicant has prepared a presentation and can answer any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Farrell. Any board questions for staff? Mr. Avery. Service road, who maintains that? Is that a DOT maintained road or is that something else? It is a DOT maintained road. Thank you. Any other questions for staff at this time? I Mr. have one we, question, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, 
Robin, in your presentation there, you showed a couple slides as far as uh, current developments, R15 versus R5. If you could go back to that and actually go back to the Cypress Village subdivision. There we go. Oh, did I pass it? Let's see. Oh, just development you might see in the general area. There we go. Well, and so or my question is, example. under the R15 of Cypress Village, we're going to slide back, um, what was the density of that development? Because obviously it's continued to stay R15. I will have to, I can pull that information if you yeah. give me a moment, or somebody can. Because when you go to the R5, the next one, it's relatively very um, close, I would say, in character if you go up the next slide up to the next R5, which is the, but really, quite frankly, both of them, but more the plantation village. So that. Cypress Village was 2.5 dwelling units per acre. Yeah, all right. And it may just be a way that the picture is situated, but it looks like a higher density project. Any other questions? Ms. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Moore, we did just double check. It appears that Cypress Village um, received a special use permit that allowed additional um, density than what was permitted um, than the 2.5 units per acre under um, R15. So that wouldn't be a great represent, representative of the R15. But. Correct. We'll change okay. that slide. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for staff? All right. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. Um, at this time, I'd, I'd like to ask, invite the applicant up, make their presentation. I believe everyone um, signed up to speak in support is on your team. So you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sam Frank. I represent the applicant. I expect that my uh, presentation this evening will take less than 15 minutes. If it does, I'd be grateful if I could have that additional time in rebuttal if needed. So um, as Mr. Farrell effectively explained, this is a continuance of a matter that you previously looked at. Uh, we've made some changes to the plan. Um, the original plan contemplated 56 units. Uh, the plan that was before the planning commission, uh, planning board previously included 50. Uh, we've now reduced that number to 46. While the actual number of units, it's meaningful that 18% um, or so of them have been taken out of the project, the relocation of those units is significant uh, in that the units removed were specifically removed in response to concerns raised. Uh, about impact on the non-regulated wetland uh, and incorporation of units that were in the flood zone. Um, so in the northeast corner, um, a couple of units have been removed and the road orientation has been adjusted to reduce the impact on those non-regulated wetlands. Uh, and in the center of the southern side of the property, two units that were previously uh, touching the AE flood zone uh, have been removed from the design. Another benefit of the revised design is that there's one less dead end and better road circulation on the internal path uh, for, the, for the drive aisles uh, and the roads within the development. The goal of the development is quite simply to provide desirable improvement to the diversity of housing options on the southern end of the county. We are in desperate need uh, of addressing the missing middle particularly on the southern side of New Hanover County. This development is an infill development designed to respond to that exact need. In response to things that we learned from our neighbors in connection with community engagement uh, and comments that you heard at the prior meeting, um, some, some things have been done to adapt the plan uh, and frankly to make the plan a better one. Um, instead of incorporating a smaller buffer with a solid fence, we've incorporated a wider 20-foot uh, buffer it, between the higher density residential use contemplated here and the existing lower density uh, residential use. As you can see, uh, and as Mr. Farrell pointed out, in the southeast corner of the development, that coincides with a 20-foot buffer uh, that exists already 
on the existing residential neighborhood, providing a 40 foot buffer between uh, the new homes in this development uh, and the existing single family residential homes in that area. Also incorporated uh, additional drainage areas um, that not only will address drainage in a more direct way, uh, although the previous design was, was pretty effective um, at drainage management, uh, this will allow a shorter path for water to travel over surfaces to reach infiltration ponds, but we also think it makes the, uh, the total development more attractive. Uh, and so while multiple smaller bodies of water incorporated into the design are admittedly more expensive, um, they make the total plan more attractive uh, and also and make, again, an easier drainage path for the water that needs it. Future land use map contemplates this area for community mixed use. One critical component of community mixed use in our ideal scenario for how this land would be developed in New Hanover County is that we would incorporate a diversity of housing options. Right now, there's a meaningful, meaningful shortage in the number of smaller, less expensive homes on the southern side of the county. The county retained a consultant several years ago to run a housing study, evaluate for us just how short are we. What do we need to fulfill the, uh, the county's needs for housing? A year ago, that study was updated. Uh, what's on your screen now is the cover uh, and a critical table from the update, the 2022 Bowen study. In a county that has just over 100,000 homes, we have a gap, we have a need for almost 29,000 homes. We are, we are almost 30% short. Um, and I realize that, that you hear that often uh, and that you're familiar with it. Uh, the, the general concept that we need more homes and we need a greater diversity of housing in the county. Um, but I thought that the county study on that point and the specific metrics were compelling, um, particularly to consider in connection with the reason uh, that the comp plan calls for a greater diversity of housing options, in particular in this area. This development approval will facilitate a more efficient alternative housing option that's well oriented to address exactly that missing middle. Um, more concisely, these are organically more affordable homes and contributing to the supply uh, that we desperately need. By providing for a, a greater diversity of housing options, addressing a need for a specific type of residential use, creating a desirable buffer between the relatively high intense highway use uh, of Carolina Beach Road and the existing uh, single family use to the east of the development. Um, this, this site plan and this proposed design fit very well uh, into the comp plan. Furthermore, um, by proposing solely residential in this area, we're proposing a solution that delivers no more traffic, uh, no more meaningful traffic than would be permitted by right. Uh, if this were a mixed use development or a commercial development, of course, uh, the traffic counts would be much greater. The current R15 zoning is no longer appropriate. Um, that's kind of the default. The zoning here was established over 50 years ago in 1971. It was established at a time when we didn't really know uh, what this area of the county would develop to be, and at a time when people had to depend on septic and well in order to provide water and sewer service. Uh, there's no question that as time goes on, it is completely appropriate um, to revise R15 zoning um, as, uh, as new opportunities present themselves. This is just one of those opportunities. Consistent with staff's recommendation, we request that the subject property be re rezoned to conditional R5 to provide for 46 missing middle homes. Appreciate your consideration of this application. In addition to uh, me being here to answer your questions, a representative of the landowner, Wes Reynolds, uh, who's also the applicant, is here with me. Our engineer, Jimmy Fentress, is also with us this evening. Uh, to the extent that you have questions you think better answered by the owner or by an engineer, please don't hesitate to ask for them instead of me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Frank. Happy to take any uh, board questions at this time of the applicant. Mr. Avery. <laughs> Mr. Frank, have you had any overtures with the Department of Transportation regarding the use of that service road and at all? We have, yep. So what kind of, what kind of feedback have you gotten? Um, so the question was raised uh, at the hearing in July 
uh, and has been raised to us by specific neighbors, how's that going to work? You know, you got a service road uh, and it intersects Seabreeze uh, at a spot that's relatively close to the signaled intersection between Seabreeze and Carolina Beach Road. Um, and a couple of responses to that. Um, first, that's an ideal situation for this land orientation because it means we don't need to get a curb cut directly onto Carolina Beach Road. The service road provides a means of access for this property to get to the signaled intersection and therefore enter Carolina Beach Road in a structured and reasonable way. Um, second, the DOT tells us that Seabreeze Road is significantly under capacity, operating at something like 10 to 12% of its capacity. But what about the specific issue of the um, proximity of the intersection of uh, the service road and Seabreeze Road to the signalized intersection between Carolina Beach Road and Seabreeze Road? Uh, and we asked the DOT whether they thought that was a matter of concern. Uh, and the image that's on your screen now is an email that we received in response from Mr. Mathis with the DOT identifying specifically that he understands the concern we're asking about uh, and that he does not have any significant concerns with that arrangement uh, in connection with this development. He notes that if we were to do something else, uh, if we were to develop the property in a mixed use fashion, more similar to um, some of the other uses that are contemplated in the future land use plan, that he'd want to reconsider it. But with regard to this specific proposal, uh, he doesn't have any significant concern. I don't think it's meaningful, but note that his response was at a time when there were 50 homes uh, as opposed to 46 homes in the, in the development. All right. Actually, I, can, I, can I follow up on that question? Yes, sir. Um, it, it seems a, a, he's really referencing the number, and, and I completely agree that those roads can handle far more traffic than that, but it's the geometry when I, I feel like was, was a bit of the concern and not necessarily that it needs to be solved, you don't need to have the answer, but I almost wanted to ask the, someone from DOT, maybe the MPO, if they could, could weigh in on, because I, I think you would understand that that, that tie-in is very close to Carolina Beach Road. So the geometry, I think, poses some, some design challenges, and I'd like to hear from the MPO that that is a solvable issue not that you, you have to present that here tonight, but that that issue could be solved. Maybe it's when, when you go to get your driveway permit, they say, hey, you have to make this a, maybe it's a right only or some, some kind of situation. But I think I'd feel a little better if I could hear from, from the MPO and um, really explain that, unless you've already done that and can answer that question. I, I just wanna, it, I'm eager to hear that too, from the MPO, but I did want to point out that if you look at the second line of this email, yeah. as it relates to the proximity of the service road intersection with Seabreeze and the signalized intersection, that's exactly, the question you're asking is exactly the question we were asking of the DOT. Um, and as a practical matter, people on the service road are going to have to wait to turn left. They're going to have to wait until traffic clears on Seabreeze in order to be able to do so. We get that from a, from a practical development standpoint. But that said, let me let the gentleman from the MPO uh, respond to you. Good evening. Good evening. So, uh, do I need to say my name and title? And Please. All that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jamar Johnson. I'm the engineering associate for the Wilmington Metropolitan Planning Organization. As it pertains to this intersection, the uh, edge of uh, the service road, uh, closest to the edge of Carolina Beach Road, it's about 35 feet. Um, this service road, it doesn't have a listed capacity. However, we do uh, understand that the DOT has a capacity to where improvements would be made at 4,000 vehicles per day. Uh, so for this entrance for the service road connection to Seabreeze, there are potential uh, uh, mitigations that could be made uh, it could potentially be that the DOT would uh, require it to become a right in right out only type of uh, deal right there. Um, based on uh, my uh, site visits, it does have a short median along uh, Seabreeze Road right there, but it still would allow for people to turn left. Uh, however, whether or not the DOT would require improvements to be made based on the driveway permit process, 
that I am unsure of at this time. Okay. All right. Well, I think you've, again, I'm putting you in kind of an, a tough position. I understand that, but um, that it is, it will be visited with the driveway permit and it, it there could be some requirements. Um, yes, there could it, be requirements. And it could be, it, it's, it's a solvable, it could be a solvable issue. I okay. believe so. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Johnson? Yeah. Mr. Chair. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have. Yes, Mr. Head. Question for Mr. Frank. Yes, sir. Um, two, two questions now. I may have more. Um, the, um, you mentioned that as proposed, the uh, new 46 units would not increase traffic, uh, AM, PM, but our information shows that it does. Is that correct? It's nominal, but you're right. It is. Yeah, it, so yeah. there is a change. There is an increase. I put the chart on the screen there. Yeah, you've got one additional car every 30 minutes. Making sure, because you said there was no, but there is. It I might apologize. Be you're right. I, I misspoke. I meant to say to you, that but it, it, there is an increase. Yeah. Now, it's worth noting that the comparison there is to residential use in R15. There are other uses in R15 that would be substantially greater that are permitted by right. You could have an elementary or a secondary school. You could have a church or a place of religious assembly in an R15 by right, and presumably you'd have significantly more traffic than we proposed. The chart that's on your table, uh, on your screen, and the one that, that staff's prepared for you assumes single-family residential development, which is a fair point of comparison. Uh, the next question was, there's a condition proposed related to the northern, uh, I get the language right, um, the northern terminus of the access easement shall be designated for public use to allow potential future connection to and through adjoining parcels to Sea Breeze Road. First of all, can you explain what that public designation for public use would mean? And then second, who, who would eventually provide that access? Yeah. Um, so for our part, what that means is we will allow this private road to be dedicated for public use to the extent that a public road is connected from the end of our property to Seabreeze Road. Um, the, that was something that was proposed to us by staff and we agreed to. Uh, as far as who would ultimately establish that road in the future, that is well beyond my pay grade. I don't know uh, who would create such a road in the future, uh, whether that would be a future private developer uh, or if the county where the DOT would be inclined to take it and establish the road. For our part, what we can control is that we can agree to that interconnectivity if the road is brought to our, uh, to our property boundary, and that's what we've agreed to do in that condition. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Frank, appreciate it. Yes, sir. Um, very appreciative that uh, I believe eight additional drainage basins have been added to the new plan. Yes, sir. Did I hear that correctly? Are these ponds or will they be dry basins? I'm going to ask our engineer to answer that question to make sure that I don't misstep. Thank you. Good evening. Jimmy Fentress, Stroud Engineering. Uh, a portion of the ponds are proposed to be basins and a portion of them will be uh, detention ponds or wet ponds. Um, the southeast, excuse me, southwest portion of the site is very suitable for infiltration, most suitable for infiltration, and that's where we propose to uh, release the water from the site. So the other ponds will be holding ponds to effectively get the water to the infiltration basins to recharge the groundwater. Is there a way to more clearly identify which basins will be retention ponds? The infiltration basins, like I said, will be on the southwest corner of the site. The large basin on the eastern portion of the site would uh, likely be just a collection basin, a bermed containment, likely dry and un otherwise unimproved. 
mostly just diked to uh, gather the water there that it can be conveyed over to the infiltration basins. Um, I may be getting a little bit ahead here, uh, but I understand there's some specimen. Well, I know there's some specimen oak trees on the property uh, having walked it. I'm not sure exactly what's being presented to save these specimen trees, but is there a conflict in constructing any of these basins, drainage basins, with saving some of these uh, specimen trees in the root systems? The intent from the onset has been to save the most specimen live oak trees that are on the property. We've done extensive uh, design work to work around these, and we continued that with the infiltration siting that they would not be impacting either the root system or the trees themselves. Most of those trees that uh, are considered specimen trees are um, on the southwest side of the property and between the units. would be between the units, um, the first eight units that are off of the service road. Most of those specimen trees are behind those eight units. And they're indicated on the, on the plan. Thank you, Mr. Fentress, Mr. Frank. Actually, Mr. Fentress, I've got a couple of just follow-up questions. As you can imagine, we get a lot of comments from, from residents, um, a, lot of, a lot of concerns on stormwater, of course, and that's, that's what you're, what we're talking about. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on, are, are you, you've had geotechnical testing out there? We have. Um, seasonal eye, water table, all the, the normal. Um, we have. So these are gonna be interconnected, is that correct? All of them will be interconnected? They will be. Okay. Is the intent, I mean, at this point. I understand, and you're not through design. We, we understand right. it's, it's still at a higher level. But then you would also, you would also have to design for for bypass and, and large events as well that would take this to the southwest? Would that be the ultimate discharge for, is that correct? By topography, and the, the land is mostly a bowl. Okay. This project sits mostly in a depression. So uh, we, probably would help. Yeah. Okay. Next one. That's the existing. Okay. okay. Th there's the result. Okay. Show the existing. I'm sorry. No problem. It, this is a zoomed up version of it, obviously, I guess. Yeah. So um, a good portion of the site uh, exits towards the northeast. And then another little bit more actually appears to exit due south. So as these We'll have to design for certain year storms for the county's detention and for the state's treatment. And uh, once those uh, storms are breached, then the runoff will exit in the same direction that it does currently. And we would make effort to keep those uh, bypasses proportionally the same relative to the area that is presently drained in those directions. And, and for the, the public that are here, what, and not exact numbers, but that is that the 25 year storm event? It and is for the county. For this area, what, what is that in, in inches approximately? It's about 10 inches. 10 inches, so significant. Okay, okay. Thank you for answering that. I just. I, it was hard to tell the interconnectivity versus how, how all that was working, but you've explained that. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions for the board at, board at this time for Mr. Frank? Um, actually, uh, I did have a question for Mr. Fentress. Um, just just want to make sure that in, in reading through the notes here, uh, it mentions 11 stormwater inf infiltration areas are total including seven additional ones. I take it that, that the first proposal met the minimum standards for stormwater retention, and then seven more have been added to exceed it, or? 
these were not due to changing regulations. This what th was the idea to add additional ones to exceed the minimum? We only in the last week received our study to do with the infiltration capabilities um, of the soils, on-site soils. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wanted to identify all areas possible that we could use for uh, either infiltration or collection to convey to the infiltration. Um, that's still the intent, but it is real evident from the soil study that the most suitable soils for infiltration are on the southwest southwest portion of the site. Okay, so the idea is both locational and additional on-site stormwater retention. To address the concerns we heard here for drainage, we wanted to provide as much volume containment that we could on site. Um, so that, that, that was the intent. Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you. All right. Yes. Yes, Ken. Ken. Mr. Chairman, I think to your point earlier, state looks at it from a quality issue and the county is looking at it from a quantity issue. And so I think by utilizing that infiltration side, you were definitely looking at it more from a quantity. Is that a correct statement from an engineering standpoint of how you designed this project? The infiltration <clears throat> is to address the treatment, the quality, and the other containment areas would be to address the quantity. The, quantity. the infiltration will serve to uh, reduce those quantities in the containment areas in as much as we don't have a discharge. But we've got to deal with the water on site. All right, thank you very much. Any other board questions at this time for the applicant? All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you. At this time, we would like to open, open the floor up to the opposition. Um, we have five people signed up. So you'll have a total of 15 minutes. There is a rebuttal period after this of an additional five minutes, but um, we'll just, I'll go through an order of who signed up. Um, if you could tell us your name and address when you come up. Um, Ms. Moore is signed up first. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, good evening, my name is Audra Moore and I live at 804 Hatteras Court in Seabreeze Community and I'm a member of the Seabreeze Committee, which is made up of many residents who are passionate about the preservation and protection of our community. Seabreeze is an area rich with history that is not well known to most, but the people that make up this community are stewards of this history and feel a duty to preserve the character of this area. We have gathered in opposition to the proposed townhome project for several reasons, and we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share these concerns with the board. At the previous meeting, statements were made to downplay the wetlands on the property requesting rezoning. I'm hoping to bring to light some clarification on this topic. The only people that know what these wetlands are capable of are the neighbors that live in Seabreeze and have experience with the impact of storms and average rainfall numbers. The first picture is of the southeast corner of the proposed townhome lots showing standing water in the wetlands area. This is directly where the last units are um, proposed. These images are taken from walking the back of the lot, the very far back of the lot where the townhomes are. Um, the picture on the left shows sunken sections of land with fluted trees that I've circled there in the red which is indicative to active wetlands, but in a dry state due to the abnormally low levels of rainfall over the past year and a half. The photo on the right shows the same area during normal rainfall. These wetlands wrap around and connect to wetlands on our property and other adjacent properties as well. Here is the effect average rainfall has on these wetlands. This photo was taken in the summer of 2021 when rainfall average was 61 inches. For perspective, rainfall averages rarely go below 60 inches in Wilmington over the past 10 years, with the highest year being over 100 inches in 2018. Last year, rainfall total was only 41 inches. This image below shows that same wetland and how they hold water well into the winter months. This picture was taken in February of 2022. 
the back section of those townhomes, the four units, wrap directly around and feed into, it's the same section of wetland that wraps around our backyard. Here, I'd like to point out the FEMA map imagery for our area and the proposed project. So much of our area borders the AE flood zone and some of the adjacent properties are in the AE flood zone. The property in question actually shows zone D on the FEMA map, which is flooding of undetermined levels. This type of land is not conducive to high density and we as a neighborhood are very worried about the impact our homes will take on from displaced water during storms and average rainfall numbers. R15 zoning is invaluable to our neighborhood. The Unified Develop Development Ordinance of New Hanover County states, district regulations discourage development that substantially interferes with the quiet residential and recreational nature of the district. The city municipal code gives further definition regarding R15, stating preservation of existing residential property value is of importance and that any uses that affect the character of existing community will be discouraged. All of the adjoining properties will be negatively impacted by the building of these townhomes, and our property values will decrease tremendously. The oak tree seen in the picture on the left, if you can see the right behind the pine tree, the picture on the left, that's 20 feet from our property line. This picture is taken from our second story great room, which is a combined kitchen, dining, and living room. The image on the right is from our master bedroom of the third story, where you can see that same oak tree. Right at that oak tree will now be a road and townhomes to the left. It honestly makes me sick. We always imagined this land would be built on, but in keeping with R15 zoning and that we would see properties through trees like we do on the left side of our home. If you can see the trees you see through in the distance, they're, they're there, but you don't feel like you're on top of each other. Um, people move to this neighborhood for the nature spread out lots and to not stare into their neighbor's windows. Seabreed is made up of owner-occupied homes, some having lived here for generations and some having moved here to enjoy the beauty and character that is Seabreeze. These are examples of the types of home found in our area and the homes that will be directly impacted by the construction of these high density units. All of these homes right now, the, they're all the ones that back up to the very, I guess it's the southern border of all the townhomes. So it's just gonna be townhome, 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 right behind everybody's lots. This is how close the actual townhome structures will be built right up to existing residential homes. The canopy will be gone in the 20 foot buffer as the tree canopies extend well past the 20 feet and our neighbors will sadly be staring into the back of townhomes when they moved here to build their dream home among an established neighborhood surrounded by nature. This is that back south, um, southeast corner. During our committee research, it was found that this rezoning request would actually be a case of spot zoning, which is illegal in the state of North Carolina, and several cases have been brought to the state and won in favor to not rezone small parcels of land within established communities, including cases here in Wilmington. The courts define spot zoning as such, in quotes, a zoning ordinance or amendment which singles out tracts owned by a single person and surrounded by a larger area uniformly zoned so as to impose upon the smaller tract greater restrictions than those imposed upon the larger area or as to relieve the small tract from restrictions to the rest of the area is subjected is called spot zoning. Please keep the integrity of our neighborhood in mind, both its character and its home values when you make your decision. This project does not enhance or add any benefit to the Seabreeze community. All right. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Next is Ms. Tiley. Good evening. My name is Kathy Tiley and I live at 1056 South Seabreeze Road. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight as a member of the Seabreeze Committee. I have stood in this spot before and I will probably be here again because I live in Seabreeze and I love where I live. My neighbors and I will continue to come out to oppose development that may not seek to but inherently will not preserve but change the character of our community. It is our responsibility to do so. I have thanked you all before for your expertise and experience and your willingness to put those traits to work for the betterment of New Hanover County. 
We realize that New Han Hanover County has a vision and a plan, and indeed, that plan is working. Hundreds, if not thousands, of apartments, condos, and townhomes are being built across the county as we speak. There are so many areas in this county where R5, R7, and higher densities work very nicely. We have a vision too. Our vision is to maintain our little slice of heaven. Our vision is to maintain the low density, quiet residential and recreational nature of Seabreeze. The reason we purchase land and built our homes here. The re reason others want to move here. The last community like it before hitting the high density beach party at Carolina Beach. The way to achieve that is through zoning. Please remember that place types on the future land use map and in the comprehensive plan are guidelines and they do not trump zoning. Recently, the board has alluded to the idea that we need to accept that R15 is going away, things are changing. Yet, as we speak, there are hundreds and maybe thousands of single family homes being built throughout the county on property that remains zoned R15. Not all development requires a rezoning. There have been no significant changes to the neighborhood that make the current zoning inappropriate. The land involved is perfectly suitable for the uses permitted under the current zoning. In fact, it is better suited to the R15 uses given the environmental impacts due to the wetlands on the property, to the local schools at almost full capacity, and the potential traffic conflicts. Last month, I expressed concern over the quality of the access into and out of the properties being reviewed. After speaking with my neighbors, we decided that it was worth bringing up in a little more detail. I appreciate that you talked so much at length about that tonight. However, I do have a slideshow presentation and a document, so please uh, indulge me on this. Um, Mr. Matthews, last month you remarked about having gone down to the property and having no difficulty getting in or out at the signalized intersection. Thank you for actually going down. I think that is awesome that you do that. And Mr. Hine, you mentioned that you went down to the property also. Thank you. Um, most times we do not have an issue either, but as you may recall, we discussed in the past the narrow, winding, double-lined roads at Seabreeze and you cannot expect that signalized intersection to be any different or any better. So we did a little traffic study of our own. We are not experts in traffic flow. We are residents of Seabreeze who drive through this intersection every day, several times a day. We negotiate it with boats being on trailers, school buses, garbage trucks, UPS trucks, and every sort of large vehicle available. We have specific concerns and uh, 4,000 trips per day that um, the DOT, or I'm sorry, I, um, whoever that is, that generates a review is uh, not gonna cut it, for, there's not gonna be 4,000 trips a day. But I want you to see how, how, this, how close this 35 feet uh, from the, this picture on the right is, the service road, along Carolina Beach Road, you can see the service road headed towards the intersection. That little, I wish I could point to it for you, that, you can see where the service road comes out and where the signal is. It's close. It's, the, 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 um, Mr. Johnson tells us it's 35 feet. I think it's probably one car length, but this uh, picture to the left shows you even closer. There you are at the stop sign on the service road, that's the service road that people from these townhomes will be coming out onto. And that's where you get to get your access onto the intersection. Um, you have approximately one and a half car lengths before the big intersection, the one with the signal. There is one lane turning into, hold on, let me just switch my slide here. Okay, on the left, one lane that comes into Seabreeze. This is now at the intersection. The, the stop line there that you see with that horrible um, little median medium in the middle there that's all crumbling, probably needs to be taken out. Um, the, the stop line is going out of South Seabreeze. So there's one lane coming in, and the one lane with a little apron so you could probably fit two cars side by side right there. You can go, this next picture on the right is, I'm sitting in my car at the light, and this is the traffic coming out of Seabreeze. I'm just wanting to show you that you can, put two cars there back, you know, one, one in front of the other before you're gonna block that service road access. So 
which, you know, fine, they're gonna, people are going to wait. But I actually have a picture that I'm sorry I could not get it in the slideshow. I know you're really going to miss seeing this one. But my neighbor took it. Of um, He pulled his truck up to the stop line there. He's at the light. And another, a pickup truck pulls out of the service road behind him. But the tail end of the pickup truck is in the, you know, can't cross the double yellow line. It's in the incoming lane. So if somebody, if, if a vehicle happened to be coming around at that time into CB's Road, he would have had to stop short. Um, another issue right now, oops, sorry, is um, picture all the way, well, both, both pictures on each side, you could see the blue roof. That's Pelican Snowball now. Uh, their parking lot is you, you back out of their parking lot onto South Seabreeze Road. That's how you get out of their parking lot. You back out of it onto South Seabreeze Road while traffic is moving on South Seabreeze Road. It's, it's pretty insane. Um, all my little arrows here, I want you to just to see that. Uh, so the middle picture coming out of the service road, you're going to be looping around here to get to the, to, um, the stoplight. Then you have... Um, Carolina Beach Road making either a left onto Seabreeze or a right onto Seabreeze or River Road coming straight across onto Seabreeze. All of those three other roads, River Road and the two Carolina Beach accesses, have turn signals. South Seabreeze Road does not have a turn signal. We would much rather have a turn signal than have to make a right only and come out and uh, go around and do a U-turn to head to Carolina Beach, but that's obviously a subject for another time. Um, we've gotten by for years, but increasing the density, increasing the ingress and the egress to the service road without improving the immediate infrastructure needs is not responsible to the existing community or nor to the families choosing Seabreeze as home. Safety remains a priority. We've talked about road hazards before. We know that it's not Mr. Reynolds' responsibility, it's not the planning board's responsibility, and it's not even New Hanover County's responsibility. No one, no one None of us here have the responsibility or the capability to make the improvements. But you do have the opportunity and the capability of not increasing the potential hazard by keeping the lower density of R15. We ask you to deny the request because the project does not preserve the character of the existing neighborhood and has potential to impact environmental and conservation resources and increase vehicle conflicts on our road. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Tiley. The 15 minutes is up. We have three more speakers that we will start in the five minute rebuttal period. So we'll go to Ms. Scanlon, Mr. Van, and Flournay. We'll be, actually you'll come up um, at the rebuttal period. Oh, okay. So um, we're, just to keep things on track. At this time, I'd like the applicant to come back up and give him five minutes um, hopefully to respond to some of the, the concerns you've heard tonight. Mr. Frank. Yes, sir, I'll be glad to do so. Would you be kind enough to bring my presentation back up? So uh, several things I'd like to say in response and, and some additional images I'd like to share. Um, Ms. Moore communicated clearly that she's concerned about uh, how flood water will work and also uh, communicated that she'd prefer to, to look out her window at undeveloped land on, on our client's property rather than homes. Um, the, uh, the second thing I, I really can't respond to uh, other than to say this is a private property owner like any other and ought to have the right to, to build on their property just as any other does. The images uh, that Ms. Moore showed you of uh, standing water are primarily, if not entirely, in the, um, in the buffer that's been proposed, the 20-foot buffer that's been proposed. There's a meaningful conversation about unregulated wetland, and so I wanted to demonstrate to you what that actually looks like. Uh, this is a, a site layout that shows the picture. Uh, pictures are taken from the vantage points shown by the arrows. So I'm going to show you three photographs, but the, the small thumbnails here show you the uh, where we stood and, and which direction the, the camera was pointed. These photographs were taken on August 22nd, 2022, shortly following a three inch rainstorm, which was followed by a three quarter inch rainstorm. Each of the three photographs is pointing towards a section of unregulated wetland. 
Um, as you can see, unregulated wetland does not look like marsh grass. Uh, it doesn't look like standing water. Uh, these areas are, are relatively dry here in the immediate aftermath of a, uh, of a significant rain event. Perhaps more importantly, um, the changes to the site that come with development will improve the drainage situation. It will improve the opportunity to take water that lands on this site and have it leave the, less of it to leave this site. Uh, as you can see from this image, this is our best effort to demonstrate how the current drainage works, how based on the topography of the, of the land where the water flows. And the second image is how the water would flow conceptually once it's engineered and designed to treat water. Now, I, I think that I interpreted some of the comments to suggest that there was an obligation on this landowner to deal with flood water runoff from other tracks. And obviously, that's more than is, uh, is reasonable to ask and more than we can address. But what we can absolutely address is how will drainage be handled on our site after it's developed. And as you can see, the whole intent of that engineered drainage system is to direct the water into specific locations so that it can infiltrate and can be treated on site. I want to talk about traffic a little bit, a little bit further. Um, first and foremost, the change to the number of cars, the increase there is nominal. We're talking about one additional car every 30 minutes in the morning at the peak hour and one, and one additional car every 15 minutes at the peak hour in the afternoon. This is not from a traffic count standpoint significant in any way. The roads that we're talking about are NCDOT public roads, roads that every citizen and every landowner has the same opportunity to use. We are beholden to whatever NCDOT decides to do in connection with those roads. We're beholden to whatever the NCDOT tells us we have to do to get our driveway permit to access the service road. We acknowledge that 100% uh, and completely. And I, I sympathize with the concerns that Ms. Meeks raised. Um, I get it, uh, but I also acknowledge that they're completely beyond our control. Uh, the, the change that we're proposing on the zoning to this land is not gonna have any incremental meaningful impact on that traffic. And ultimately what needs to be done with that road will be determined by the NCDOT. It's also worth noting, it's in the staff report but wasn't included in the presentation, that Seabreeze, South Seabreeze Road is operating at like less than 20% of its capacity. Um, I think if I remember correctly, the staff report reflected a capacity of 4,000 cars per day uh, and the DOT counts were somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 cars per day. Uh, and so while I certainly understand that the geometry of that intersection is potentially challenging. Um, I, I object to the notion that what we are doing is going to create some sort of additional unreasonable incremental burden on Seabreeze Drive. That's all I have to contribute about that, although I'm certainly here and interested to answer any further questions you may have from us. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Frank. Um, any questions from board at this time? If not, I'm going to, I'd like to, thank you, Mr. Frank. Absolutely. Thank um, you. I'd like to turn it back over to the opposition. We have Five minutes, but only only five minutes. But we have three speakers. Um, first to sign up, I think, is Miss Scallion, if I'm reading that correctly, and then Mr. Van, and then Ms. Flournay. So, if you have five minutes, we, we'd like to hear what your thoughts. Good evening. My name is Kate Scanlon, and my address is 1068 South Seabreeze. Um, condense my, my thoughts here. So uh, I have a couple of, of comments that I would like to make. The first is, is that we ask that the pace of approving rezones from lower density to higher density is in line with the, with the pace that the county updates and modernizes our infrastructure at a county and a community level. We understand that there is a significant housing deficit, but we're building, building, building houses, and the infrastructure is not keeping up to speed. In Seabreeze, we all pay quite a bit of taxes, and we frankly don't get a huge amount of benefit. We, we have to pay over $15,000 to hook up to water and sewer. We pay for our trash. Um, the state obviously is supposed to maintain the road. We just don't see a lot that we get, um, you know, and then so adding this additional density um, is concerning for the folks in the, in the neighborhood. 
um, particularly with, um, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but at the community meeting, we were under the impression that these townhouses are also 3,000 square feet. Is that true? Yeah. Those are actually, the size of those townhouses are quite a bit larger than the average house even in Seabree. So you have lar large townhouses in a very dense area. Um, and, and we do just, and we are thinking about the development of the community as a whole. The county has a vision for Seabreeze, but we have a vision as members of the Seabreeze community based on the fact we have many residents that live here and have lived here for multiple generations. Um, we are an existing community. You might look and see a lot of empty and vacant land. Yes, there is. And so when we start changing the zoning, we have a lot of concerns about other properties as they come up, both big and small. So yes, R15, some may say it's outdated because we can get water and sewer, but it's quite costly to add that water and sewer, and it's only if Aqua actually approves us to hook up to it. Um, I also want to speak to you as a resident. I speak to you as a resident, but also as an individual who has 12 acres of undeveloped property in Seabreeze under contract. This property will be developed at an R15 density, retaining the wooded and coastal characteristics of the neighborhood and with features that will provide benefits to the entire neighborhood. We're trying to look at the overall vision that we have of Seabreeze, which is pretty strong. And as these developments come up, do they fit into our vision of what we would like to see going forward? I also believe that the math um, and the real estate markets say that this can be profitable. We, not every piece of vacant land that is on the, on the comprehensive plan needs to be rezoned um, to, a, to a higher density. Um, in conclusion, while Mr. Reynolds and the CB Cottage team have to answer to their investors, we as taxpaying local residents ask you, the planning board, to deny the rezoning until SB Cottages can submit a plan that is additive and a better fit to this historic community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Van. Mr. Van, your time is, is ticking. If you'd rather have the, the next speaker come up. Responses okay. that you did not get, they were given to me or Mr. Farrell. Okay, if you could give us your name and address. Yes, my sir. name is Harold David Essendell. I live at 810 Roscoe Freeman. I own property at 814 Roscoe Freeman. I thank you for the opportunity. There's a lot of new information tonight and I have not had a chance to assess all of that. So. I'll be as brief as I can. I read your comprehensive plan, and it is a plan. I never found the word mandate anywhere in it. Uh, the board recently has denied four different applications, two in Seabreeze, not entirely because of density, but was mentioned in every single one of those four in the last 18 months. Um, during the meeting, the last meeting, the applicant brought up the fact that there were financial considerations. <clears throat> and obviously, the, de the developer has to make a profit. Excuse my voice, I have a problem. We are aware of the costs involved in bringing sewer and water. And the developer at that time said <clears throat> this would be a benefit to the community. I don't see how that could be. It's only going to benefit his development if you approve it. If the total number of units is decreased too low, the act will probably have some sort of financial difficulty. However, I believe you can easily go to R15 and make money based on the cost of lots. The decision, however, should not be based financially. That is not in the purview of this board. That is his problem, not yours. A board member stated sometime at the last meeting, people want to come here, and I understand that. I did too. But that does not mean you have to acquiesce to every single developer who wants to bring in five units here 50 units there, 10,000 here, or whatever the number. Carolina Beach right now has many units being built. Just north, you people have approved at 6,800 and 6,830, many more units. Seabreeze is a single family residential area. 
every time you, and even though this is a small area, every time more traffic, and it's horrendous now, and there is really no solutions. They've worked at Carolina Beach um, College in Oleana for years trying to figure it out, and it's not going to happen. Uh, some years ago, 98 acres was purchased by the county for the landfill, and that was supposed to last until 2050, now revised till 2035. And under consideration, that's probably not going to work again. Traffic is horrendous. Schools are loading up. And this is just getting to be, even though this is a small area, every one of those things, <coughs> excuse me, contribute to these problems. Businesses are doing well in this town. I own a business. Revenue for the county is up on the sales tax. So are my property taxes. All of the development, everything that's going on has never brought my taxes down. Promises are not made that way. It is difficult, if not impossible, to put a value on green space, much of which will be lost to 46 units and the hard services that will accompany them. But if you look through the Seabreeze community, you will find almost <coughs> every, I'm sorry, every single family residence has small, medium, and large trees, and that is conducive to a certain sense of serenity and quietness. Small animals, songbirds, hawks, Mississippi kites are now part of the makeup of this neighborhood, along with deer and coyote, and they roam freely. There is an aesthetic appeal of calmness and nature, which is hard to quantify, but it does exist and should be essential, and I might add necessary for you to consider. Quite a, quite a few changes were made that I'm not aware of. Sea breeze is, was, and should be R15 to deride the fact that the county in 1971 put R15 in and is that is so sort of obsolete. Well, it's not obsolete. Thousands of those homes have been built in the last 10 or 15 years in this county, happily enjoyed by many people. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, the opposition is out of time, actually, I, if the board doesn't mind, I'd like to give um, Ms. Florinay two minutes. I hate to, everyone came out here if, is it, is it, I'm sorry, I might be pronouncing that wrong. Mr. Florinay, sorry. My name's Laird, I live at 909 Salt Spray. Oh, Laird, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the only thing I gotta say is looking at over all the legal court cases for rezoning in North Carolina, there's a lot of precedent that says if, it, if it's a detriment to the neighbors, the neighboring communities, if it's a detriment, then it's not legal to rezone it high density. That's all I gotta say. All right, thank you very much. Okay. All right, at this time, um, I, actually, uh, before I close the public hearing, are there questions for the applicant or any opposition from from the board. No? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing and open it up for, for board discussion. Mr. Avery. This question for um, Rebecca. Isn't a good chunk of the end of the Seabreeze Road zone B2 business? Yes, there, there is B2 at the end of Seabreeze Road. Do you remember Road. how much acreage that is? I don't know off the top of my head. We can factor that in and get back but, to but, but it is zone B2, and there are certain uses permitted by right that generate lots of traffic under current zoning, correct? There are current uses that could be tra um, larger traffic generators, yes. Okay, thank you. B2. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. I have, I have a question. I think it would be best for Mr. Johnson. Okay. Is he still here? With the Wilmington mm -hmm. EPA? He is. Thank you. Um, twice I heard, once from you, the mention of a right turn only. Yes, sir. Was that a reference to the access to sea, to sea breeze from the service road would be right turn only? So they would that not be a, able to make a left to the light? 
Correct. That could be a potentiality for this uh, service road connection to Seabreeze. However, as I'm not the DOT, I do not have any say in their driveway permit uh, process. And that is all I can say about that, truly. Right, that, that, it's that, that may have answered my second question. Uh, is it possible for, for um, the county to put a condition on this application that they provide a right turn only at that intersection? I cannot answer that. Mr. Hip, we, we can condition, but I would, I would be leery to condition design Traffic. requirements. Yes. Understood. I just asked. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Right, right. Um, all right. What, what, more board discussion? Matthew? Um, I, oh, Mr. Hip. I, I'll going. lead off and, and just say that I, I, I continue to have difficulty with increasing, with, with recommending a change that would do anything to increase traffic along the service road as it relates to the intersection at Seabreeze. Um, if a connection were made at, at this um, northern terminus, uh, if that was made at this point, that would alleviate that concern. Um, the applicant mentioned that there are commercial uses by right that would be allowed here. Well, those, in fact, are, um, besides golf course, I think golf course is in there, but those are um, a, a library, a park, a school, uh, and an EMS station. Well, as a member of this board, I would probably recommend an increase to traffic for those public uses. But anything that increases traffic, uh, I have difficulty with. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, back to the point about uh, connectivity. Connect, we talk about connectivity uh, a lot. And this, while it provides connectivity within the development, it really doesn't provide any connectivity to the adjacent roads. Uh, we talk about buffering or transitioning from high traffic areas to lower density areas. Um, well, that's why we have R5, R7, R10, R15. This goes straight from R5. This cuts a swath of R5 all the way back up against R15. There is no transition. So those are, those are the concerns that I have. Uh, the, the, I assume that the design, the, the ordinances and the design, the engineering requirements will address the, the stormwater issues, and I'm confident that they will. But the, the concerns I have are the lack of really a transition from high traffic to R15 connectivity and the increase uh, of, of a potentially very difficult situation uh, where the service road intersects with Seabreeze. Those are my concerns. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hip. Other board concerns? Mr. Chair, I have Ms. a couple Moore. questions. I think some of these may, may um, be directed towards staff, either Robert or Rebecca. Um, I'm going to start with the question on the comprehensive plan. And obviously, there is a Seabreeze small area plan that was also completed. As the comprehensive plan was put together, there was a lot of stakeholder meetings, community meetings, and involvement in that. This area. I would assume was noted as a um, mixed used area due to the growth mode to the north? Um, actually, from our understanding, it was designated as community mixed use, at least um, partially because of what was in the Seabreeze small area plan. Um, at that point in time, um, and during some of the public hearings for other properties in this area last year, it was noted um, how long ago that plan was created. But at that point in time, um, the area that currently is zoned um, B2, which we have looked in is about 10 acres in size, um, there was a desire to try to um, rehabilitate it to kind of bring it back to what it was during its heyday. Um, and so the, in, the additional density was intended both because of the Carolina Beach Roadway and then also to help support a potential commercial node in that B2 area. Okay. All right. So taking into account what was currently on the ground as far as zoning and trying to use that to the advantage of the mixed use. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, Robert, one of the questions I have, first of all, on the buffer, um, 
what is exactly allowed in that buffer? I know the county has differing buffer types. Um, and this would be the 20 foot buffer that's allowed on this property or shown on this property. So the 20 foot buffer is required in addition to that because of the housing type adjacent to single family residential, there would be a type A opaque buffer and that could be a variety of things between vegetation, fencing or a combination of both. Gotcha, okay. As far as the housing, obviously there's been a lot of discussion on housing um, from both sides um, and I understand both of the concerns and challenges there with housing. My understanding on this property is an R15 though that the way that the current UDO is structured, really R10, R5, R7, R15, R20, and really almost any residential use, all of the residential uses are pretty much permitted. Now some do have specific standards that attach along with those. In this particular piece of property as an R15, duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes, townhomes, and single family are all allowed, correct? But they very well may have site-specific standards to those. Correct, so under certain standards of uh, performance, residential, and uh, those kind of additional buffers. So those would be allowed. What's the maximum height requirement for residential in some of those, or some of those uses? And some of the other our residential zoning districts. Mm -hmm. I can pull that up. Sorry Again, to catch you off guard. <laughs> it's okay. Let me look at that. And I guess my question is more coming to Mr. Chairman of the board. You know, the comments were driven to us as far as the project itself backing up to some of the current single family. We're literally talking about townhomes that are a single family residence. They're just structured different and built different. Right. Um, we're not talking about a multifamily component here. No, I, I agree. It's so the zoning is going to dictate attached. the height, which is no different than the height that was dictated on the other properties that were shown us. Matter of fact, they're probably going to be higher because I noticed that they were piling supported structures because they were probably built into a flood zone. I just kind of wanted, I, that's something I noted on that. Um, Mr. Moore, just to confirm, all of our R residential districts, um, currently the height maximum is 40 feet unless they're a piling um, um, raised structure and then they're allowed up to 44 feet. Right, we have that exception in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. so. um, Mr. Chairman, I don't think I have any further comments right this second. All right, thank you, Mr. Moore. Any other board member care to weigh in at this time? Mr. Hine. Thank you, Chair. I may look at things maybe a little bit different than others. Um, when developers come in and look for rezoning, to me it, it's, it could give us compelling reasons that are good for the community for rezoning, for the overall good of the community. And there's some very compelling reasons of this submittal uh, firmly believe the drainage plan will improve the drainage for everybody uh, involved, uh, Seabreeze community as well as the developer and future residents of this track. Preservation of specimen trees is absolutely wonderful. Um, as I did mention, I've walked the property and I have the mosquito bites and the sand spurs to prove it. Um, there are some really beautiful trees and at some point in time, you know, whether it's this development or something in the future, you know, a lot of trees are going to come down, but the concept of preserving those uh, trees, that's another compelling reason to, to look at um, the rezoning request. Um, but I, I continue to have severe heartburn over the density, meaning the, the compaction of the, the number of units on the southern border um, that backs up to the houses along uh, Roscoe Freeman and Salt Spray Lane. Um, I just find that the, the land plan itself is not compelling to me, and it's strong enough. The other two compelling reasons I, you know, gives me positive feelings, but that in and of itself kind of overrides the compelling reasons. I feel like it's not a compelling land plan. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Tarrant. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> during last month's presentation, I was pretty outspoken about my concerns regarding the wetlands area and the overall drainage plan. And, and I do commend the revisions that have been made to the concept plan because I do feel they've at least addressed, um, you know, they made some considerable concessions to those particular areas um, up in the north, uh, northeast corner specifically, and then you know, obviously down towards the, what, southwest corner. Um, I, again, I, I just think the concept plan as revised is much better than what it was um, when it was originally brought here. And during my comments last month, I did not have an issue with the density. I still don't have an issue with the density. And <clears throat> the use of the townhomes as a transition to the existing single family is exactly what we're looking for um, as we move to development because of this, uh, for the reasons that Mr. Moore pointed out, which is when you have multifamily um, and you have the height associated with the larger multifamily apartment type development, you are looking at, you know, obvious um, site issues, privacy issues, and intrusion into uh, directly adjacent single family development. The transition through the use of the townhomes provides um, some, and, and, and for lack of a better word, but some buffer from a highly trafficked uh, roadway and the normal, very high density, heightened multifamily apartment buildings and having those intrude on your single family residence. The townhomes to me, you know, unfortunately, I do have sympathy for the existing residents. Um, there is going to be development in that area. There's, whenever we have vacant property in this community, um, someone's looking to buy it and someone's looking to build on it. Um, everyone wishes that their adjacent property could stay nice and wooded and, and, uh, and, and free of, of development. This board, I know, has had multiple applications come before us in the Seabreeze area. And I'm very familiar with Seabreeze and most of the members of this board are very familiar with Seabreeze because of those applications and because of um, you know, our, our time here in the community. And we've, I think, done our best to be very sensitive and cognizant to the history of Seabreeze, um, to the fact that we are aware of the type of community that it is. Um, the location of this particular application is not in the interior of Seabreeze, and it does make a difference. Um, it is adjacent to the thoroughfare, to Carolina Beach Road. Um, and so <clears throat> that's not lost on me. Um, again, I do think that there have been some good changes made to address the drainage concerns. I share some of my fellow board members' statements about the fact that the engineering and the design plan will probably handle most of uh, of the drainage questions and concerns that we had previously, but I'm not concerned about the density um, particularly. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Matthews or Mr. Avery, did you? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, First off, I'd like to um, commend the neighbors for, for coming out tonight. Uh, you're organized, you are organized, uh, you're civil, and unlike so many neighborhoods that, um, that come before us, you had the courtesy and the intelligence to touch on a number of different points rather than hitting on the same one, and we thank you. Um, you know, it's, it, it's tough, you don't want to, to to change anybody's perfect world. Uh, when we're looking to do, make decisions on where to increase density, we've got to consider you know, how, how far it goes off of a main road, how deep into a community it goes, uh, whether or not it's proximate to, to a stoplight. Very few, very few um, remaining tracks are immediately proximate to a controlled intersection and that from a place like Carolina Beach Road, that, that is important. I mean, some people are gonna want to 
go and turn left and, and go to Carolina Beach for certain. Um, that service road, while uh, several people, Ms. Tiley, I remember, made, made a very good point, provided pictures. I wish it were more than 35 feet off the intersection. Uh, it's not, but at least there is a controlled um, intersection there, which is better than many of the other uh, tracks we've been asked to make a decision on. Um, the applicant has come back and have, has added, I believe, seven additional uh, retention uh, areas. Uh, I've never seen that done before. Um, there's tree preservation here. Um, they, they have, albeit marginal, they, they uh, decreased the density. Uh, they've tried for interconnectivity in the, within the development. Um, if I were trying to make any changes to the existing development, it would be hard to think of anything more that they haven't um, thought of and, and tried, to, tried to change, quite frankly. Um, it does provide, uh, it provides a transition from Carolina Beach Road into the community and it's going to largely keep traffic from going into the community it, it, itself. It's not perfect, but um, as the county continues to grow and we're trying to provide alternative housing, um, I think it checks enough of the boxes um, that, um, that I'm pretty favorable. All right. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Any other board comment? All right. Well, at this time, I'd like to um, invite the applicant back up. Um, and hold on. Based on on the board discussion and items presented during the public hearing, would you like to withdraw your petition, request a continuance, or proceed with a vote? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We ask that you please proceed with a vote. Thank you very much. All right. Before we go to a vote, I would like to point out uh, the comments that we got today from Robert. Uh, one of the property owners has asserted that this property, being a wildlife mecca, it, it has endangered species on it, uh, red cockaded woodpeckers and northern saw-wet owls. That's far from true. Uh, saw-wet owls are not endangered. Our, our red cockaded woodpeckers are, but that's not habitat suitable for red cockaded woodpeckers, just for the record. But since that goes as part of this public record, just want to make sure that we don't make statements that aren't true, true. Thank All you. right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Well, at this time, I'll entertain a, a motion from the board. Mr. Matthews. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I would, um, as soon as I can find my, my correct place here, I would like to, uh, to move forward. Um, okay, Mr. Chairman, I, I would uh, move to recommend approval of the proposed rezoning. I find it to be consistent with the pur purposes and intent of the comprehensive plan because the proposed density and housing type is within the recommendations of the community mixed use place type. I also find recommending approval of the rezoning request is reasonable and in the public interest because the project provides housing diversity and an appropriate density to act as a transition between the, the highway and residential development to the east and the proposed additional conditions will do some impacts on environmental concerns. I would also like to add the pro proposed conditions. The project as shown on the submitted site plan shall be developed with water and sewer connections to a private wastewater system. Private wells and septic systems are not allowed for residential development as contemplated on, on the site plan. As identified on the site plan, certain existing trees will not be removed. Three, the, uh, the zoning approval and development contemplated therein shall not impact the current and future lot owners that own the following parcels, um, R08518-001-0014-0001, next one being R08518-001-015-0001, as well as R08518-001-015-0001. 
dash zero zero one dash zero zero five dash zero zero two. Right to use the access easement shown on the concept plan. Shall, nor, nor shall the zoning approval and development contemplated therein create any additional financial burdens on those lot owners to contribute to the cost of maintenance for the access road. The northern ter terminus of the access easement shall be designated for public use to allow potential future connection to and through the adjacent parcels to CB's road. Finally, number five, all infiltration basins shown on the concept plan shall be required. Changes to the general shape of the basins as required by essential site improvements may be accepted administratively by planning staff. Mr. Matthews, very quickly, um, because of the testimony tonight that they're both infiltration and detention basins, um, if you could revise that last condition so it says all stormwater uh, management areas shown on the plan instead that may be more um, specific to what we had intended with the original condition. All right, I would like to amend the motion to, to reflect uh, to include all of the existing, excuse me, all of the additional stormwater uh, retention uh, areas uh, that have been shown on the revised uh, site plan. Mr. Chair, I'd yes, like to Mr. second that motion. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Don't Actually, have discussion before you move. Yeah, that's why I wanted a second so we could have discussion. Um, Mr. Avery. The blanket statement about requiring all infiltration basins on the property as shown on the site plan is a little bit, I think, out of place. They're still in the design mode. We don't know at this point in time what that final design will look like. And, and to require this site plan to show infiltration basins as it is when the time they get through going to the county permit process and state permit process, they may not need all that. I think that's kind of why they added that second line, um, changes to the general shape of the basins can be administratively accepted. Um, I get that, but <clears throat> Those will be dictated by the county engineering department and by the state of North Carolina. Great. Are you requesting an amendment to the motion? I'm not requesting an amendment, Mr. Chairman. I uh, was, I'm just had a little heartburn with that, but I can live with it. All right. Well, no need to modify. We have a motion and a second. Any, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. All right. We've got five in favor and two opposed. The motion does pass. And I would like to remind everyone um, that came out that this item is going before the county commissioners on Tuesday, September 5th. And that meeting will begin at 4 p.m. Thank you very much. Um, I'll let everyone have a minute to, to get out. We have the next item to move on to. All right, I'd like to go ahead and keep moving, just in an effort to not have this meeting run so late. We're going to jump to item number three. That is a request. Sorry, for zoning map amendment application Z23-16, request by Aaron Hutchison with Summit Design and Engineering Services, applicant to rezone approximately 1.34 acres, zoned R15, residential, located at 4580 South College Road to CZD CB Community Business for a vehicle, service station, minor and other limited uses. This is a public hearing. We will hear a presentation from staff. Then the applicant and any opponents will each be allowed 15 minutes for their presentation, an additional five minutes 
for rebuttal. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask staff for their presentation. Mr. Biddle. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. This application is a request to rezone approximately 1.34 acres from the R15 residential district to conditional community business district for maximum 6,000 square foot minor vehicle service station. The site is located at 4580 South College Road. Both the site and the majority of the surrounding area have been zoned R15 since 1969. At that time, the purpose of the district was to ensure housing densities remain lower due to the need for private wells and septic systems. Since then, public water and sewer services have become more available in the area. Though CFPUA water is available, sewer access will require a mainline extension. This aerial photograph details the surrounding land uses. West of the proposed development is the approved performance subdivision, Jasmine South. Also west is a residential development within the city of Wilmington that is intended for attached and single family residences. Northeast is the Whiskey Branch plan developments. And those zoned R15, both the adjacent north and south properties are non-residential in use. Here's the same aerial photo with images of the property from different angles. The top image is taken along Jasmine Cove Way. The bottom image was taken along the South College Road corridor. Here are examples of single family residences you might see in the R15 district. The 6505 Carolina Beach Road image is an example of a single family residence along a major corridor, whereas the Cottage Grove is an R15 performance subdivision. Here's an example of a minor vehicle service station that is similar to what is being proposed at the subject parcel. This particular service station is found off of Market Street in the Porter's Neck area. Minor vehicle service stations consist of operations that involve small repairs to personal vehicles, consisting of oil changes, wheel alignments, and muffler repair or installation. Here we have the applicant's concept plan. The applicant has proposed site access to be from both South College Road and Jasmine Cove Way. However, NCDOT has noted a preference that precludes the South College Road corridor as an access point. The proposed structure is a 6,000 square foot building with 10 bay doors. Five of the bay doors will be on the eastern side of the structure facing South College Road. The other five are to be on the western side. As per the applicant, each bay door is to serve an individual vehicle, allowing up to 10 vehicles to receive maintenance at one time. Here we can see that the applicant has proposed two stormwater ponds. Between the parcel to the south and the proposed project, the applicant has conditioned a type A opaque buffer that transitions from 20 feet wide to 10 feet along the property line. It should be noted that while public sewer is available in the area, the nearest utility connection to this site is over 800 feet away. To accommodate this hurdle, excuse me, to accommodate this hurdle, the applicant has proposed a septic system for the site. With that said, the board should note that the site has identified class three soils, which can present severe limitations to private septic systems. However, a condition has been provided that a soil scientist will evaluate the site to discern if a private septic system can be accommodated or not. In the event that it cannot, the applicant will be required to find an alternative septic system or tie into the main sewer line. Here's an image of the proposed structure along with the estimated elevation. The proposed use, minor vehicle service station, is permitted by right within the CB district. However, there are additional use standards that apply, such as the automotive towing operations are prohib prohibited, all, re all repair work or lubrication shall be conducted within the principal building, no operator shall permit the storage of motor vehicles for a period of excess 24 hours unless the vehicles are enclosed in the principal building, service or customer vehicles shall be parked on the premises in a manner that will not create traffic hazards or interfere with the vehicular manu maneuvering area necessary to enter or exit the site, and the premises shall not be used for the sale of vehicles. Excuse me. No outdoor work shall be performed except in the areas designated for such activity on an approved site plan, and Outdoor work areas shall be fenced, walled, or screened to minimize on-site and off-site noise, glare, odor, or other impacts.
This is the proposed development, um, excuse me, the proposed development is potentially accessible by two points of access, the South College Road Corridor and Jasmine Cove Way. Due to planned highway improvements in the area, however, NCDOT's preference is to preclude the South College Road access point, making Jasmine Cove Way be the sole means of ingress, egress. These arrows detail the means of entry to the site. These arrows indicate all the points of exiting the site. And here are two locations approximately 1,000 feet north and south for travelers to perform a U-turn. Nearby, there are two approved higher density projects un under development, a subdivision and a plan development. These projects have triggered a traffic impact analysis and one state transportation improvement program, the details of which are in the staff report. Trip generation, uh, this slide depicts the estimated trip generation for the site. The proposed development would generate approximately 66 a.m. and 67 p.m. peak hour trips. The estimated traffic generated from the site is under the 100 peak hour threshold that triggers the ordinance requirement for a traffic impact analysis, or TIA. Though this project was not considered in the Whiskey Branch Plan Development TIA, general traffic growth in the area was included with recommended improvements to accommodate future growth. The project is located along a local road perpendicular to a major arterial roadway that is nearing planning capacity. The local road, Jasmine Cove Way, is accessible by a right turn in and exiting is a right turn out. A U-turn to go north on the South College Road corridor is approximately 1,000 feet southbound of the Jasmine Cove Way. In addition, the project will be subject to NCDOT driveway permitting. Due to the site's size and proximity to the College Road corridor, the parcel is less likely to be developed residentially. The proposed development is located within a mile of the Monkey Junction growth node. While the immediate portion of the South College Road corridor has not seen commercial growth, the CB district is designed to provide lands to accommodate developments of businesses that serve surrounding neighborhoods with goods and services needed for a variety of daily and long-term purposes. The comprehensive plan designates this property as being a part of the community mixed-use place type. This place type includes commercial uses and encourages infill developments along highway corridors. In addition to serving as a transition between the highway and neighboring residential uses, the proposed project will provide a use that could be appropriate in nodes as well as transitional areas while providing service to nearby residents. <clears throat> Staff has found that the proposed zoning request is generally consistent with the 2016 comprehensive plan. Because the propo proposed project provides for the types of commercial uses recommended in the community mixed use place type. The proposed project is found to be reasonable and in public interest because the proposal allows a service oriented use that could serve as an appropriate transition between the highway and ex existing residential uses. As a result of the policy guidance of the 2016 comp plan, zoning considerations and technical review, staff recommends approval of the request with the following conditions related to buffer yard requirements, driveway access, tree retention, utilities, and a limit to the permitted uses for the rezone property. Should the rezoning be approved, development of the site will be subject to additional development review to ensure all land use regulations are met. This concludes my presentation. Representatives of the WMPO and engineering are here, and the applicant has prepared a presentation and can answer any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Biddle. Um, if you'll stay right there for a second. I think Mr. Avery's got a question. For yes, Mr. Biddle, could you um, <clears throat> go over the definition of vehicle service station minor? I, I saw what's in the text here. I'm a little confused as to what services are actually allowed. Um, they have 10 bays proposed, and I, I can't imagine them surviving without tire cells. And you mentioned wheel alignment, but I didn't see anything about tire cells. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely, yes, sir. So the uh, definition is uh, personally owned vehicles, essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, that does everything from wheel alignment to wheel patching, tire uh, replacement, um, exhaust installation and or repair, oil change, uh, chassis lubrication, um, and I think that's the extent of, or just about the extent of the vehicle minor service station. 
I thank you for that. I'm still a little bit confused as to what really can be done under that definition. Um, I'll, be, I'll think about it some more. <laughs> so, so I just haven't got it sorted out in my head yet. Thank you. So Mr. Biddle, they couldn't do, because I think you're, thank you for your presentation first. Thank you, sir. Um, since there's no outdoor work proposed on the site plan, um, they wouldn't be able to do that. As well as you mentioned, they couldn't do vehicle sales. I'm assuming under zoning code, they couldn't leave vehicles, um, broken down vehicles for long periods of time. Could they do the, I'm trying to think of what would be an eyesore for this area, the U-Hauls movement through there, those kind of things would not be permitted. Is that correct? U-Hauls are not part of the uh, vehicle service station. Um, the definition for minor vehicle service station is for personally owned vehicles, not for like fleet vehicles or uh, moving vehicles. Or, or commercial vehicles. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. 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 Moore. Interesting point there, though. As far as vehicles that are being, um, I guess, in a queue, so to speak, to be worked on. Um, let's say that all ten bays are full of vehicles right now being worked on, and I bring my car up there, my truck, and I've got to wait to Wednesday or next Wednesday to get it fixed. How's that handled in this zoning ordinance? Excellent question, sir, and one that I think the applicant would be more apt to answer than yeah, I can. I will pull up the site plan for you, though, and we can speculate. So if access is through Jasmine Cove Way, I imagine there's going to have to be some sort of configuration that directs traffic in, uh, uh, between the, the, the two sides and the tin bay doors. All right. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Hill. Mr. Biddle, um, can you go over again the comments regarding um, the driveway access, uh, in particular the College Road access? You mentioned uh, that DOT had an opinion. I, I forgot, the, I don't remember the term. We're using the term preference. preference. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, essentially, because of the uh, extended, oops, sorry. Just to give a little clarification, because it was a little, we had gone to, I'm sorry, Stravey, we had, More uh, uh, we had approached DOT about their comment uh, several times. We did receive a response that there are planned improvements to College Road that would involve widening it, and uh, while DOT, you know, reviews driveway access permits uh, on an application basis, uh, the provision that there would be a roadway expansion could impact that future driveway if it were there. And I think their preference would be to avoid that future potential conflict. But as it stands, we haven't received anything that states that they would prohibit it or um, uh, not consider it if it applied for. Thank you. All right. Mr. Chairman, I have one more yes, comment. Mr. Moore. This will probably be for staff and also I think for the applicant. Um, obviously we had some discussion about the septic field. I know you mentioned the soil types are very challenging there. Um, so my question is going to be a little half and half. CFPUA has a policy for sewer connection. Um, can you elaborate on that for the board? I can. Uh, I got information uh, this afternoon that CFPUA has a, an established, in fact I think I have that information here. Um, excuse me. 500 feet they can mandate tying into the uh, main line uh, however the applicants as per CFPUA uh, is 850 feet or approximately okay. if you need to see that information I can pass that to you though all right thank you very much Mr. Biddle we, we will turn this over to the applicant um, at this time I, I would invite the applicant and um, we have I think Mr. Greg Thompson and Aaron Hutch Hutchinson um, signed up uh, to, sp to speak in support. And we actually also have four other people to speak in support. James Moore, James Sh Schmidt, Danny Gore, and Lewis Smith, um, if, that's, if that's correct. So um, please, we, you have 15 minutes. Please, please give us your presentation. Certainly. Oh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Greatly appreciate you uh, allowing us the time to speak on behalf of Christian Brothers Automotive this evening. Uh, my name is Aaron Hutchins with Summit Design and Engineering Services. Um, 
Uh, I do have with me the project engineer, uh, Mr. Greg, Th Greg Thompson. Uh, we had hoped to have a res representative of Christian Brothers here with us tonight to answer any specific details. Unfortunately, they had a commitment and could not make it. They do send their apologies. So I will do my best to answer any Christian Brothers specific questions on their behalf. Uh, with that, we are here to uh, request a uh, uh, recommendation for approval for the conditional rezoning at 4508 College Road for the Christian Brothers Automotive. Uh, just a general overview into what Christian Brothers Automotive is and what they provide. Uh, you can see on the screen, but uh, uh, generally they're a low-impact, environmental-friendly automotive service repair center provider with a concentration in light automotive maintenance services such as diagnostics, brakes, fluid maintenance, oil changes, and cooling systems. Uh, these are generally the top five services they provide at all their facilities. Um, all cleaning supplies are environmentally friendly, delivering no pollutants to the environment. Uh, CBA also strives to achieve an aesthetic, uh, uh, arch uh, an ex an ex a high aesthetic standard, excuse me, uh, for architectural style and the materials that they provide uh, with their designs. Uh, their general hours of operations are Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., with the one exception being the one, uh, first 180 days of business, and that's just to help get the location established. Uh, here we have a typical set of site requirements for uh, each Christian Brothers Automotive. Um, roughly a uh, three mile population greater than 30,000 people. Um, uh, typical lot size is anywhere from 0.7 to 1 acres. Uh, in this case we're a little bit larger for this particular request. And generally their use is light in nature and minor, uh, considered minor auto, uh, automotive repair. Christian Brothers facilities are developed, uh, as I said, to a standard of higher features and uh, architectural elements that helps mesh uh, residential neighborhoods with other commercial uh, uses, uses nearby. Uh, Christian Brothers shops service approximately 4,200 vehicles per year per shop, and shops are highly rated on Google with an average uh, 4.7 star, 4 star rating. All shops are independently audited by the AAA as well as RepairPal for training, certifications, equipment, and customer satisfaction. Uh, as you can see on the, the screen, the lobbies are quite indicative of a, a hotel or a doctor's office, and that's in an effort to ease the transition for uh, folks entering the facility that may not be comfortable without a pair of uh, maintenance needs and uh, in an effort to make them feel a bit more comfortable and welcoming. Uh, same can be said for the uh, entrance to the facility. Uh, again, it's intended to be inviting and welcoming and uh, mesh well with the community it surrounds. Or that surrounds it, pardon me. Uh, much like we saw from the staff's presentation, here's a vicinity map for the location. Here we have a, uh, uh, the surveyed boundary uh, underlaid on an aerial to help uh, depict the existing condition, conditions, which as you know by now is uh, significantly treed. Uh, just to give some background into where uh, we're at in the process and the steps that we've taken to get to this point, on April 5th, we held a pre-application conference with New Hanover County staff. We reviewed a very preliminary conceptual layout at that time, and then we discussed the proposed use as it relates to the future land use map, uh, community mixed use place type. And then we discussed the, uh, community, the community business district, excuse me, business district as a baseline set of guidelines for buffers, setbacks, and like for the property. As well, we discussed the challenges of connecting to public sewer. We discussed minimizing runoff to College Road, uh, the College Road right away. Uh, later in May, as we were trying to nail down the specific elements of the site layout uh, for the client on the client's behalf. Uh, we did reach out to staff and ask for them to confirm that the UDO had no set requirements with regards to bays facing the public right-of-way, or in this case, College Road. Uh, we, we had on, we've had ongoing discussions with NCDOT with regards to the driveway play, placement. That was based on some of the feedback that we had received in our community engagement. We are currently awaiting uh, PERC test results uh, from soil scientists uh, to properly evaluate the septic field and uh, the feasibility of that. And then uh, we had the tree inventory uh, completed on April 11th. For our community engagement, we uh, created a mailing list based off the county's specific criteria for doing so uh, for uh, property owners within the uh, 500 feet of the, uh, the, the parcel location. Uh, we arranged a meeting and coordinated that with the Sierra Grove Assisted Living Facility. Uh, we did that by, by design. Uh, we wanted to be very close to the community and uh, make that meeting as ac accessible uh, for the residents as possible. 
And uh, we also wanted to thank uh, Cedar Grove Assisted Living for uh, allowing us to work in their schedule for their daily activities and, and host that meeting for us. Meeting notices mailed, were mailed out to the property owners on June 2, 13th of 2013, uh, 2023, excuse me. The notices were po postmarked on June 15th, and only two of those notices were retur returned. Uh, the meeting, meeting themselves on uh, June 27th, as I said, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Five members of the community attended the meeting. Uh, four of those were re residents of the Jasmine Cove neighborhood. Uh, their general concerns were uh, impacts to traffic along Jasmine Cove Way. Uh, they also shared a concern for the need of a signalized uh, intersection at the uh, intersection of Jasmine Cove Way and College Road. Uh, and as well, they were worried about tree removal from the site and the buffer that it presently provides uh, to traffic and noise along College Road. Uh, we had many conversations with the residents. Uh, we described um, in more detail what the buffer requirements would be per the code based on the zoning district. We described the building type and the materials and how they would be used in conjunction with each other to help buffer any noise, uh, both from the use as well as from College Road. And then uh, we agreed to share their concerns with DOT and let them know um, how they were feeling about the traffic at that intersection as well as Jasmine Coveway. Uh, and here's a map that we showed that we, uh, uh, that we pulled the addresses from for the uh, uh, community meeting. And then here's our conceptual layout as it was submitted. Uh, so far, with regards to um, uh, general layout, again, we used the community business district as the baseline for how we applied the site elements uh, to the code. Um, so far, we've identified the, with the stormwater co control measures that you see on site, We've identified generally based on the survey elevations that we've got from the topography to get those generally in the low points. We have not gone through the full engineering design to see what those devices would be yet, nor do we have the uh, results from an infiltration study to see how well the soils would handle that type of device. <clears throat> One thing we would consider as part of the stormwater treatment for the site or a mechanism of that uh, would be uh, the use of permeable pavement in the parking areas. And that, in general, concludes the presentation. Uh, again, I have uh, my, the project engineer here, uh, Mr. Greg Thompson, if you have any uh, specific technical questions. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Do we have uh, board questions? Mr. Hepp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, interesting project, uh, attractive project for Carolina Beach uh, for South College Road. I think it would be attractive. Uh, question, though, is this, is this a prototype? Uh, that, that Christian Brothers does in other locations? Yeah, great question. They do have a series of set prototypes. Uh, Atembe is the largest of the prototypes that they have with their assessment of the area and the need that they see here. The Atembe is what they propose. They do have a nine bay version. It's more linear uh, and uh, would, would take up more land space along a singular property line. But uh, yeah, they, they generally have two prototypes. Um, and I'm sorry that uh, a representative isn't here because this is kind of a specific question. Uh, you know, the, the, the zoning, the proposal does not allow any exterior storage of, of, of any merchandise or anything. And there's almost no storage in there. I'm not a mechanic. So uh, how, where do they keep the oil cans and the coolant and the brake pads and... Uh, they do keep that in an interior storage area, uh, and if there is a vehicle that needs to be serviced and uh, it must be left overnight, they do pull that inside and it is enclosed in the building overnight. All right. If it's a prototype, I assume that they're addressing that and, and, and they've addressed it over time. They have a very the, efficient The plan process. did not seem to show really a lot of storage for uh, equipment or uh, repair parts that they might use. Understood. Thank you. Yep. All right. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hebb. I have actually a question. Um, obviously, you wanted to hook up to public sewer. Um, yes. We want you to hook up to public sewer. Um, our county has spent a lot of money on extending. We, we hate to see septic coming in, um, but if that's, if that's what it has to be, um, we, we understand that. Um, I guess one of the questions I had was seeing stormwater with proximity to potentially septic fields. Um, and also, you, you really mentioned you hadn't done the stormwater design, but my question was, because a lot of times comments we get, neighbors are always worried about flooding here, as, as you know. Yep. 
Um, do you even know what direction that stormwater, your overflows would, would go? Is there a, a ditch series that is near you or adjacent or something? Um, Generally speaking, yeah, the answer is yes. We, we have a rough idea where that go. There is a, a relatively flat ditch in Jasmine Cove Ways so and not a lot of capacity there, obviously, for to handle additional runoff. So we'd have to be aware, you know, cautious with that. There is a more significant ditch in the DOT right away, but naturally we can't show that we're increasing what we're putting there. Right. Uh, so we've got to handle that accordingly. So it would just be a method of storing and detaining at the correct rate from the site. So you may be going underground. You, you mentioned it's certainly a possibility. Okay. Underground is certainly a possibility. Yes. And are there any requirements, oil water separators, anything because of your use? Uh, great question. So as a safety mechanism in an effort to help uh, capture any potential spills, they do uh, implement a 750 gallon uh, oil water separator interceptor, uh, which. Uh, at any given moment, the most chemicals that they would have on site would be 615 gallons. So that is in, in, intentional to be able to capture the worst case scenario should there be a spill. Naturally, if they do have that old water separator, that can't go to the septic field, so they would have to uh, apply a pumping system, uh, a pump and haul system for that uh, device. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? You've got, there's four more people signed up to speak in favor. Are they like your team? Or are they just, do you know? Um, uh, I believe a okay. couple of them may be uh, the property owners, but okay. I, don't, I don't know the full list. Okay. So. All right. Well, if there are no further questions, thank you for, for your presentation. Okay. Um, we still have time. So Mr. James Moore or James Schmidt, Danny Gore, and Lewis Smith all signed up to, sp to speak in support. If anyone would like to do that, now would be a good time to come forward, tell us your name and address. Um, you don't have to speak, but if if you'd like. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is James Moore. I live at 118 Tanglewood Drive. I am a member of Wilmington Shrine Club, currently the treasurer who is the seller of the property. Mm. Just came out in support, nothing to really say. If you got any questions, we'll try to help you. We, d we are keeping an additional, I think it's a little over four acres that we still will retain for the Shrine Club so, all right. all right. Thank you very much. Any other like to speak, sir? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members. My name is Lewis Smith. I'm a member of the Shrine Club as well, native of a Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm also the Sudan potentate, which is the uh, CEO of our organization in Eastern North Carolina. Um, I went to the previous briefing that was held for the neighbors. I was an observer. I thought they made a very good presentation, had good diagrams. Uh, I can't tell you our organization has been trying to do something with this land for much longer than I've been a member of this club. Um, it's sat unoccupied. We've tried to lease it. We've tried to sell it. And recently we had three offers. Uh, I was very impressed with the presentation. Uh, I like the aesthetics of the building. It looks like a small fire station. Uh, <clears throat> the presenters uh, made it very clear that these 30 parking spaces, they don't intend to have full. They're there for overflow if all the bays are full. Um, we think it's a good fit for the property. I heard the concerns of the homeowners, the loss of the trees. They've got another development going up with 42 units. I've seen very little traffic on Jasmine Way. Uh, the traffic condition presented by DOT is complicated when they change that intersection for safety reasons. Uh, we have trouble with it also, but that's a DOT matter. Uh, we use the building very seldomly. We have some small units that meet there. One meets there every Monday night. We may have 10 or 15 cars there, and we're right at the entrance opposite to this land. Um, once a month, we have a larger meeting. We may have 15 to 30 cars, but it's all right there at the entrance, uh, very little traffic problems. So we do support this um, plan that's being proposed, and uh, we'd like your consideration. All right, thank, thank you very much. Mr. Chair, Mr. Yes. Smith, Mr. excuse me, Mr. Smith? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, 
Question, you mentioned you recently had several other offers. Were any of those related to residential as it's currently zoned? I would have to pass that to Mr. Moore. Thank you. All right. Danny Gore or Lewis Smith, any interest in speaking? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, James, James Schmidt, sorry. Uh, my name's Danny Gore. Uh, I'm a Wilmington native uh, all my life, <laughs> really. Uh, and I'm right now president of the Wilmington Shrine Club. Uh, I've been a member of the Wilmington Shrine Club and Shrine, Sudan Shriners for 25 years. Uh, one thing I would like to say that this has not been an effort that's gone untalked about, unlooked at for five or more years. I was president of the Wilmington Shrine Club in 2009 when this was first brought up. Uh, we had several offers at that time that we turned down uh, because we didn't think it would be the right thing to do to the neighborhood, to our Shrine Club, uh, and uh, just to give a little bit of history of our Shrine Club, we used to be downtown on Ann Street, bought that property out there, and most of the residential property behind our Shrine Club was originally our land that we sold, and that development was put in all the way back to the nursing home. Uh, we've been very adamant about making sure when we had vendors or whatever come into the Shrine Club that they thought about the residents behind, kept the noise down if we had uh, events at night, that sort of thing. Uh, and we were very Christian brothers with their uh, aspect of, of what they want to do, uh, to me, seemed like the lowest impact for a commercial uh, property that we've looked at since I've been involved since 2009. Uh, we've turned down several times, turned down very, uh, even Black's Tire, you, you mentioned Tire, Black's Tire looked at the property, uh, and uh, we didn't do that. So this has not been a, a knee-jerk deal. This has been a long-investigated, long-term deal. Uh, Jimmy Moore that got up and spoke, uh, he's been very, very diligent in making sure all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted for us and the residents around us. Uh, we've been there a long time and we want to stay there a long time. And, and we want to be, you know, good neighbors. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. We do not have anyone signed up in opposition. Is there anyone in the audience that wanted to sign up? All right. Um, We'll go back to the applicant. Did, um, Mr. Hutchinson, do you have anything else you want to present? You have five more minutes. You don't have to. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. This time I'll close the, the public hearing and uh, open it up for board discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am appreciate the application. I, th I think it's a good use of that particular piece of property. Um, I prefer, um, much like the DOT, <laughs> to see if that's the right word. I, uh, my preference is that they not include the uh, access on Carolina Beach Road. It would be or South College Road. It's uh, would be right adjacent to um, the access to the church, just to the south. So I think there's some issues there. Hopefully. The, the, the Shriners Club seems to have been serviced by uh, uh, Jasmine Cove Road. Uh, I would think this service station could be accessed as well from that area. But in general, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very attractive uh, uh, proposal. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hebb. Any other board discussion at this time? Mr. Mathis? I was just going to say that um, I'm aware that, that property has been either for sale or leased for a long time, and even though it's a great site for for any number of reasons, it's it's been problematic to uh, to find a a good user, the best user, and um, 
I've never seen anybody design a, uh, an automotive facility with all the architectural amenities and considerations that this one has. Uh, it looks like uh, y'all have been very diligent about uh, protecting yourselves and, and being concerned for your neighbors uh, behind you as well. I just wanted to commend you as sellers for that and the fact that uh, we're used to seeing people here to protest most anything uh, and no one is here and it's been advertised uh, speaks for itself. All right, thank you, Mr. Matthews. Any other board discussion? Mr. Tarrant, I don't know. All right. Um, before we proceed with a vote or a motion and a vote, I'd like to invite the applicant back up to the podium and based on the board discussion and items presented during the public hearing, would you like to withdraw your petition, request a continuance or proceed with a vote? Mr. Chair, we're ready to proceed. All right, thank you very much. And request a, see, anyone propose a motion from the board? I'll, I'll move. Mr. Um, Tarrant? I move to recommend approval of the proposed rezoning. I find it to be consistent with the purposes and intent of the comprehensive plan because the project provides for the types of commercial uses recommended in the community mixed use place type. I also find recommending approval of the rezoning request is reasonable in the public interest because the proposal allows a service-oriented use that could serve as an appropriate transition between the highway and existing residential uses. Um, proposed conditions, a type A opaque buffer yard shall be provided along the rear property line of the abutting residential lot located on South College Road. The buffer will taper from a 20 foot wide vegetative cover to a span of 10 feet wide consisting of vegetative cover and a fence buffer. Number two, a street yard buffer shall be provided along the property line that borders Jasmine Cove Way consisting of an 18 foot wide vegetative field that tapers to a 10 foot wide space omitting the Jasmine Cove Way access point. And number three, planning staff may accept changes to the driveway access locations as required by NCDOT. <coughs> Number four, existing trees identified on the concept plan shall be retained on that site, on site that are not required for removal due to essential site improvements. Number five, applicant is required to have a soil scientist evaluate the class three soil on site to ensure that the location can accommodate a septic system. Applicant uh, will seek an alternative septic system or tie into the CFPUA line in the event that the class three soil prevents the use of a septic system. And number six, permitted uses shall be limited to vehicle, service station, minor, business service center, repair shop, offices for private business and professional activities, retail sales, general and child care center. All right, we have a motion. Can I get a second? Second. A motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on to the preliminary public forum for a special use application for S23-04, a request by Douglas Grant, property owner for the use of for the use of campground and RV park at three parcels located at 8102, 8104, and 8106 Sidbury Road, zoned R15 residential and totaling approximately 19.21 acres. So this is a preliminary forum. The purpose of this forum is to facilitate an open and transparent discussion of the yes of the special use permit application and to provide an opportunity for public comments and questions. Please note that per state law, the planning board will not be making a decision or recommendation this evening. Instead, the, instead, the decision on the application will be made during the Board of Commissioners quasi-judicial hearing where public participation will be limited to parties withstanding and witnesses providing evidence through sworn testimony. Anyone interested in speaking in support or opposition of the project should sign in and speak tonight at this meeting, regardless of standing in the matter. Staff will in introduce the application, then the applicant will be allowed 15 minutes for their presentation, followed by the applicant's presentation. 
Following the applicant's presentation, we will have 20 minutes for public questions and comments and then allow the applicant time to address them. The board members will then provide their comments and ask questions of the applicant. At the end, staff will give an overview of next steps in the special use permit process. We will then close the forum. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to staff introduction. Uh, Mr. Farrell. Thank you, Chair and members of the board. Uh, as you just heard, this is a preliminary forum for a special use permit request for a proposed RV park in an R15 zoning district. To elaborate a little further, these preliminary forums allow the planning board to provide advisory review, comments, and suggestions to the applicant and public on potentially relevant and material evidence, findings of fact, and issues or areas the Board of Commissioners may, may need more information on in order to reach a, re a required conclusion. And Again, please note that as a preliminary forum, uh, neither the planning board or staff will be making a recommendation. When the Board of Commissioners evaluates the request for approval, they must determine that the following four conditions are met. That the use will not materially endanger the public health or safety if located where proposed and approved. The use meets all required conditions and specifications of the Unified Development Ordinance. The use will not substantially injure the value of adjoining or abutting property or the use as a public necessity, and the location and character of the use, if developed according to the plan as submitted and approved, will be in harmony with the area in which it is to be located and in general conformity with the comprehensive land use plan for New Hanover County. Getting into the specific request, the site is located in the 8100 block of Sidbury Road, and from the aerial photography, we can see the site is currently wooded and bordered by single family residential to the north and south with an equestrian facility to the east and NCDOT owned mitigation land to the west. Here's an aerial photo of the site with images of the property from different angles. The property has direct full access on Sidbury Road. The nearby farm road is an, sorry, the nearby farm road is an unimproved private right of way. The property does not access onto farm road. Additionally, the site is in proximity immediately east of the future Hampstead Bypass that has an anticipated completion date of 2030. The parcels were originally zoned R15 in the 1970s. At the time, the purpose of the district was to ensure housing densities remain lower due to the need for private wells and septic systems. While public utilities are not currently available, New Hanover County has funded a project to extend water infrastructure through the northern portion of the county, ending at the future Hampstead Bypass. Due to NCDOT wetland mitigation land and the Sea Green Farms conservation land to the southeast and existing sewer utilities from Pender County, future development east of the bypass is anticipated to be served by private septic systems or through utilities provided by Pender County. RV parks are permitted with a special use permit in most low to moderate density residential districts to ensure they are appropriately evaluated for the site, for the specific site and surrounding uses. The UDO contains supplementary standards for RV parks that regulate the number and size of spaces, open space, setbacks, access, and requirements for environmental health approval of private wells and septic systems. The proposed concept plan is for a 66 space RV park that includes a maintenance building, a management office and laundry facility, a clubhouse with bathrooms and a pool, and a 0 .40 acres of passive recreational open space adjacent to a proposed stormwater pond. As proposed, the site will be served by private well and septic. Four areas of the property have been designated as the future septic areas. The applicant is also proposing an additional 50-foot vegetated buffer around the perimeter of the property. Condition has been included requiring the buffer and the preservation of the existing trees. The comprehensive plan designates this property as community mixed use, which is intended to promote a mix of retail office and residential development at moderate densities up to 15 units per acre and a building height range of one to three stories. As a reminder, when the Board of Commissioners evaluates the request for approval during quasi-judicial hearing, they must determine that the following four conditions are met. And again, the purpose of the preliminary forum is for both the Board and the public to discuss components of the proposal that are not clear or where additional information is needed in order to understand the project, provide advice to the applicant on the presentation they will be making at the Board of Commissioners meeting, 
advice to parties speaking in opposition on what they may want to consider when preparing for the Board of Commissioners meeting, and advice to both parties on potential issues that should be addressed before the public hearing. This concludes this part of my presentation. Uh, Jamar Johnson with WMPO and Galen Jamison with County Engineering are present, and the applicant is here and can answer questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Any questions for staff at this time? All right. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to invite the applicant up, uh, Mr. Nichols. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Matt Nichols. I'm an attorney in Wilmington, and I'm here this evening representing the applicant and property owner, Doug Grant, who is with me here, and we appreciate the opportunity to make a, hopefully, a brief presentation, and more importantly, hear the board's comments, questions, and comments and questions from the public, so thank you. We do have a presentation that I think will hit some of the highlights of the proposed development and then um, I think explain it a little better also. So if there's a way to pull that up. Yes, thank you. As Robert explained, the property is roughly a little bit over 19 acres. Um, my client actually owns four parcels. The proposed RV park is on, or sort of what I would call the front three parcels. And my client's uh, home, he's lived here for 10 years, he's owned all of this property for 10 years, is located to the rear of the property. So Mr. Grant intends to own and operate the RV park and be on site, continue to live in his house and be the operator of the park. Combined, all of the property is probably 20 to, a little bit over 22 acres, and uh, Mr. Grant's home is on about three acres. So um, the site plan we can get into in more detail and, and answer any questions. I, I think Mr. Farrell did a, a great job of, of highlighting some of the main points. Um, it's 66 spaces. Most of them are pull-through spaces, but there are some back-end spaces. Um, there's essentially three structures on the property. There is a uh, office and laundry facility. There is a uh, clubhouse with restroom shower facilities uh, to the center of the property. And then there's a maintenance building. Uh, and then there's a swimming pool. So um, the, um, as Mr. Farrell mentioned, um, the property is, my client has agreed to and has designed around this. Our uh, designer here is, uh, Dan Weeks, uh, landscape architect, and um, we have a 50-foot vegetative buffer around essentially all sides, which we think um, is is a uh, a benefit. Um, we have um, you can see the most of the RV sites are are they're all sort of centrally located, but the majority of them are back toward the back of the property, and uh, we have a. Um, as a result of the community meeting, we made a few changes. One of those were um, we did add a fence to the entrance of the property. Um, we're completely open to suggestions on the fence. If the neighboring property owners do not want the fence, that's perfectly acceptable to us. If there's a certain type of fence or how to design the fence, um, we put that in there. Uh, that was not previously shown. Um, in comparison to an R15 development, um, I would contend there's a number of benefits that you get with this. Um, the setbacks are going to be a lot more generous with the proposed design. Uh, the front, I mean, the, the rear setback in the R15 is only 20 feet. Um, you could have higher buildings. These are, none of these buildings are, uh, these are one story. These are not big buildings that I mentioned, the clubhouse and the maintenance building. Um, but if you were to build this out under an R15 development, um, even the staff report mentions you'd have a higher traffic impact. And I, th and I think you'd also have a different traffic impact. Um, they note the differences in the AM and the PM peak hours. These are just, just a different use. It's not the traditional um, AM, PM peak hour that you would get with an with a with a R15 development. Um, we put this in here just to show the proximity of the site in relation to the Hampstead um, bypass that is going in. Um, this is just a large scale. You can see the property shown with the arrow and the yellow star. 
And then just to give a little closer context, you can see, again, the dotted uh, line that goes sort of north and south on here is the proposed route for the Hampstead Bypass. You can see how close we are to it. Um, and you can also see uh, from this uh, GIS slide that this is in the community mixed use place type as, as Robert mentioned. So I listed a few of the benefits that we think um, should be worth considering is with the special use permit, you'll have a specific site plan and we'll be limited to that. We'll also be able to put conditions through the special use permit process. We're doubling the rear setbacks in many instances way exceeding that. Uh, the buildings are gonna be I think smaller than you would see with a residential development. It's less traffic, uh, no impact on the county schools. These are, this is temporary use. These are not, um, this is not uh, a, ho a permanent housing development. We talked at the community meeting about limiting the um, stay of the uh, guests and my client's willing to limit that at 30 days. So this is not intended to be permanent use at all. It's temporary use of operational RV, uh, uh, RVs. Uh, and then uh, I think it's important to point that it does support tourism and the local economy. These are, um, you know, RV parks are very popular and my client is gonna, again, gonna continue to live there. He wants to do a really nice job with it. Um, and then I just sort of showed, again, sort, sort of some of the, the vicinity. You've got um, probably our, our largest neighbor to the, uh, on the right side of the screen is the Russell Reach horse farm. Uh, that's where we held our community meeting. It's a, it's a wonderful facility, it's beautiful. Um, the, um, you can see the applicant's home at the rear of the property, and then a large portion sort of on the opposite side of uh, the farm road there is DOT property, and that's where the, the, uh, the bypass is going in, in that general vicinity. So um, with all that being said, we're, we appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, make the presentation and look forward to um, any comments and questions you may have. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Nichols. Any, hold on. Mr. Chairman, I have some questions. I'm not sure if you want to wait until the end and let public comments go, because I have probably about 10 questions that I think Mr. Nichols may want to hear. Um. And I'll, I'll defer to you. No, I think um, I'm trying to look at how we're supposed to script. Um, I think it, it'd be appropriate to ask these questions. We may, maybe some of the questions that the public already has. So let's go ahead and ask them and, and see okay. if we can get a formal answer. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nichols, thank you for that presentation. Yes, sir. Um, pretty familiar with this concept. We do a lot of camping and have been a lot of campgrounds. From a staff perspective, you mentioned 66 sites. Um, I believe the applicant is probably going to have some type of staffing yes, employees. Yes, sir. Okay, because you've got trash cleaning, um, reservations, all sorts of things that are going to be happening. So I would certainly maybe um, look at that and alluding to that in a presentation. Um, as far as the times and hours of operation, you know, you did mention the 30 days as far as duration, duration of stay. But as far as the times and hours of operation, I did note that there was a fence. I think that's already there on the property, so it's technically a gated site. Am I correct in that? That's correct, yes, okay. sir. So I would look at maybe enhancing and discussing what are the times and hours of operation, particularly for the pool and the other amenities and when they're supposed to be operating. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, as far as pads, concrete versus the rock pads, I know there's two types you can do. Both of them work for campgrounds. Um, but maybe alluding to what type of pads and facilities these campers are going to be placed on. It does make a difference in some sense. Yes, and then clean out stations and pump out stations. Are those going to be on the site themselves? Yes, you know, typically campers, when they're done camping, they have to pump everything out and they typically utilize that site um, to do that which yes, would obviously connect to your septic system. Um, RV models, the types, what types are you going to allow? One of the big new types right now is park models. Um, they're more of kind of a stay longer duration than 30 days, but they can be moved. Um, I think I would allude to that as well. Um, are there any restrictions on the type of camp campers or models? 
cabins and store, uh, storage of our, well, let me touch on cabins, I guess. I know one of the big things that's moving to is having cabins. Um, the state park does that, KOA does that. Our ordinance is a little silent on exactly what's allowed. So I would look at that and maybe discuss that with staff. And then as far as storage of RV, many, if you're saying that this is for recreation and tourism, if I live in Raleigh, Charlotte, or wherever, and I want to be able to store my RV and not have to trailer it every time, is there a component of storage of an RV to where I come in, hook it up, bring it on a site, put it back in that storage? Those are my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I can, Mr. Nichols, are, would Mr. You? Chairman, I can try to address some of those. I may have to defer to my client on a few, but if, it, if it's appropriate, I can try to answer a few of them. I, I think that would be great. And again, this is kind of the advisory role where yes, uh, this preliminary forum, but yes, if you're willing to, to answer those, I, I think we'd be excited to hear it. I will try and I may need Doug's help. So employees, uh, yes, great point. I think we would anticipate probably three employees, um, including Mr. Grant, uh, plus Mr. Grant. Um, and then um, the uh, sort of the roadways, I would say the driveways in there, the, the ordinance requires 12 feet minimum. We've gone beyond that with 16 feet. There's planned to be asphalt. Um, I think that would be better with not having dust. I think it'll be quieter, be a better use. Um, the sites themselves will be um, similarly uh, paved with asphalt and probably a, not, not the entire site, I would say, uh, there'll probably be a 12 foot strip going through the, say if you took a typical pull through site, and then you would have maybe a 10 by 15 or maybe 20 by 15 um, additional pad, and that would be probably for your, you could have the grill, the fire pit, um, things you would typically see at a at a, a nice campground. Um, I don't think park models were. Is that? There would be no. no park the, models. Right. So it would be the class class A, class C, uh, travel trailers, and, but they would be um, uh, no no park models. Um, as far as storage, there's no storage shown or contemplated. It's not for RV storage. At the maximum that we discussed would be um, someone could could have their uh, RV there for up to 30 days. And that was a big point at the community meeting that they, that there was concern about not having this turn into someone living there. So my client is perfectly agreeable saying 30 days is the maximum you would have to, you would have to leave the site after 30 days. Um, but 30 days is still, I think, sufficient time if there was someone in town maybe on temporary, uh, you know, temporary work or vacation or something that it would still function well at 30 days. Um, there will be individual su um, sewer and water connections at each of the 66 sites, just like you would see at, a, at what you would typically see at a, at a, at a nicer campground. Um, I don't know if I answered all the questions, Mr. Moore. I understand that because you're going to connect them to the system itself, the septic system. So the real question, obviously, maybe if there's going to be a pump out. So in other words. If I'm leaving that site and my RV is full, there is typically a pull-in before you leave at yes, the park sir. to where you can basically dump your water or your sewer. Yes, sir. Yeah. Doug, that, yes, okay. yes. And that, that again, I think you would typically see that at a nicer campground. Okay. I would, I would maybe note that somewhere. On yes, the sir. Right. All right, thank you, thank you, Mr. Moore. No, no, and oh, no, there's no permanent cabins. I know some some of the uh, campgrounds you'll go to, uh, they'll have sort of permanently placed cabins that can be rented. Uh, they're usually very nice, but this is these are all temporary. There's no permanent permanent cabin structures on the site. Mr. Nichols, that while we're looking at the site plan, yes, and, and because this is tied to a site plan. You're taking it to the commissioners. I understand as you get into design, there will be some, some revisions. Um, one thing I look at, just I'm always looking at stormwater. I understand you have a fairly large stormwater pond, um, but just the practicality of where that's located, if it's a flat site, which I don't, I'm assuming it's, it's a fairly flat, you're pulling impervious or you're pulling drainage from impervious across the entire length of that um, 
area to get to that stormwater pond. I, I just, I wonder, I know it, at this stage you try to stay high level. Um, is there a good outlet there for stormwater? The, the kinds of things that do come up that the commissioners are accustomed to seeing on a pretty well dialed in site plan um, that I would, again, stormwater in this county is always front and center. Yes, and uh, with the, the amount of impervious that's going down and, and both the gravel and, and the asphalt concrete, um, physically getting it to that stormwater pond and then that stormwater pond outletting and also having your septic fields all around the stormwater pond. There's just some, 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 I guess some of the function of the site plan that I think um, could be discussed further. Yes, sir. We, we know that we need some additional information there. My understanding is the pond was located, um, Mr. Weeks put it in the low spot of okay. the, with the, uh, the data that was available. So it was located on like the low spot of the property, but we um, are working with um, others on the team and we're still refining the plan and that sort of thing. But I completely agree. I think that the stormwater is an important issue with everything that's before this board and the, and the county commissioners and we will um, certainly take that to heart and have more information. Fantastic. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, Mr. Nichols. I'd like to now open this up to uh, the public comment period. Um, we have six people signed up that, that can speak if, if they choose. I'll just go down the order. Um, I think we've said we, we've got 20 minutes. Um, Mary Phillips, if you'd like to speak, please come up to the podium, give your name and address, and, and tell us your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I'm new to all of this, so bear with me, please. Uh, I live at 7708 Sidbury Road, and um, I am on the board of the Coastal Therapeutic Program, uh, which the county gives us a grant of $20,000 a year. Um, and GE, PP, um, um, PPD used to, but we just had a huge donation made of 100000 by a private donor. Um, and it's made up of um, mostly volunteers. And Kim and her husband have uh, been on Sidbury Road with Coastal Therapeutic for 10 years. So they have developed the property right next door and there is probably if i i'm just guesstimating 550 feet that this rv park a, a butts up to russell's reach farm um and each property has 19 about 19 acres so they're about equal i live down the street and i have 15 acres, and this is a very rural area. Um, so we are a nonprofit, and for the last two years, we've been given grants, as I said, from New Hanover County. Over the years, we've also been given grants from PPD, GE, Corning, uh, and then all of us have given to the program financially. We participate with Special Olympics. Um, now we have a new sheltered arena, rain or shine, for our clients, for the patients, for the children, the disabled, the autism kids, um, veterans. We cover three counties, and now we have the veterans coming to us from the VA and up in Onslow County. So Rob, Av Rob Zappel has come to us and was at the ribbon cutting uh, for the um, large covered arena, which now lets us have, we don't have to cancel classes because of weather or any of that. We have inner city kids that come out in the summertime They've never been able to be with horses. 
Now, what really upsets me about this thing, and I was going to go into your special use, and I'm really nervous, but anyway, I was going into your special use areas here, and this RV park does not provide any harmony for um, a program that, you know, continues to serve the young children, the military, PTSD, autism, MS, and other physical disabilities. I mean, we're all really fortunate that we haven't had to deal with that, but maybe some of your families have, you know. I have a serious person in my family that has mental illness. These kids didn't ask for their disorders. But what really gets me is that anybody from this RV park can walk through the 50 feet, foot green area and start feeding the horses. There are special horses for this program. You can't I mean, it's like having a huge golden retriever. They're good, good animals. And they're special for this service. They're like service dogs. So if this is going to go down, I highly recommend that whether it's 700 feet or 560 feet, that a um, 10 foot or a 12 foot privacy wall, wood fencing goes up that whole thing, just like you would do in a big city if there was a subdivision on a highway. We can't afford to lose our horses to beer bottles, 4th of July celebrations out in the country. It's just not a fit. I would love to see him find something. I mean, if we have to go down the road a stick belt, you know, but this, and because we all live out there, the land doesn't perk, just like you were all very concerned about. So the slabs that the RVs are going to go on you know, that we've had such huge rains, and, you know, the runoff now goes right to Sidbury Road and fills the ditches up. There's no place for it to go. I rest my case. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just really, really sad for a beautiful area that probably some of you guys have gone out there and hunted and, you know, and the... And we still have black bear out there. What are they going to do with their trash? They're going to have to have trash. I'm, I'm not kidding now. I mean, we have black bear. What will they do with the trash to prevent the bears from coming in to that little community? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Laura Brooks, if you'd care to speak. Okay, declining. Uh, Roger Brooks. I'm Roger Brooks. I live at 350 Island Creek Drive. And I don't have a lot of questions. I, you know, I'm a blue collar guy. And I'll just tell you, I lived on Sidbury for 22 years. The speed limit on Sidbury is 55 miles an hour. So if I'm going 55 one way, I'm going 55 the other way with a trailer and I hit a car, it's 110 miles an hour. And my big question is, how are they gonna get these trailers into that park off Sidbury? I don't know if any of you have been out there, but Sidbury is a two lane road with a 55 mile an hour speed limit. So how are you gonna get in there? Do you got a 30 foot trailer? and you got a truck pulling it, I don't understand. I don't understand how it's going to work. The septic systems, we have well water and we have septics. They're going to come in. It, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be terrible. And I want to know what they're going to do on Saturday night. There's nothing around there. 
We're four miles from, from, from market and we're four miles from college. And he's telling them they can get the, they can get the Riceville Beach in a half hour. There's no, you can't get, you can't get the Walmart in a half hour from there now. So that's all I have to say. I just, it's just, it bothers me that this is going to happen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Leonard Workman. I'll be in order. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. It's happened all my life. <laughs> it's the way it's spelled. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for this opportunity. The this, is, um, this is a new experience for me, and I praise all of you to be sitting here listening and deciding on what to do. Um, congratulations for, for what you do. I also live on Sibiri Road. My name is Leonora Workman. I live right in the middle, 7536 Sibiri Road. We've been out there for 45 years, so we are seeing a lot of change. We were out there when it was a dirt road. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is just a two-lane road now. Speed limit is supposed to be 55. We know what that's like. I know what it's like because I have to wait maybe five minutes to cross the road to get my mail. Um, as well as Roger, I'm very concerned on how these big vehicles are going to be able to maneuver in and out of the driveway that he's going to be um, creating for the vehicles to come into. I'm also concerned on is there going to be signage and is this going to interrupt the residential feel of Sibiri Road. Sibiri Road, part of it's in Pender County, a very small portion, the other parts all the way through New Hanover. As you probably all know, on each end now, we have a very large um, development going on. One is the Trask Land, and the other one is called Sidbury Station. Um, they're being built, they're being occupied. Yes, more cars are being on the road. There's also a hospital that is being built on College Road, fairly close to the emergency room that's there now. I'm not quite sure when it's gonna be finished, but that means, as it is now, Sidbury Road is used as um, an ambulance, you'll be hearing that noise going back and forth. So my really main concern is road safety. Like Roger mentioned, the vehicles coming in and out, is that going to be safe? That curve, we also have crazy people that like to drive fast motorcycles. So what happens if you're going fast and all of a sudden an RV is trying to make that curve to get onto the road to either go one way or the other? Do not know if there's a requirement for DOT to make an assessment on the width of the road and the amount of time or amount of space it takes for a vehicle that size to make the turn in and to make the turn out. That's my main concern is the safety. Thank you so much for All your right. time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin Hudson. Thank you, Chair, Chairman. Uh, Kevin Hudson, I live at 8100 Sibbury Road, and I'm the one probably most affected because I'm right there. My driveway, we share the same driveway entryway. Uh, again, my main concern is, say, when the bypass comes through, it starts right there at Farm Road. It's actually going to be a bypass that goes over the new highway coming through bypass. That is another area that we're worried about safety coming over that hump, and then right there, you're if you're your RV is crossing over the road, turning into that driveway. It's uh, one of my big, biggest concerns. Uh, also proposing fencing and stuff like that down our driveway. Uh, what it is proposed, what I've just seen on those pictures is it's gonna block part of my driveway. I have a circle drive that goes and we share that same entryway. Uh, I don't know where we could possibly discuss that or change something into that point. Uh, and again, uh, transient, uh, people coming in, being there for a short period of times. Uh, it's a very quiet neighborhood. I'd say noise, noise pollution, light pollution, all that stuff. There's going to be signers. There's going to be light and stuff like that. It's mm -hmm. very dark there. There are no street lights. We like that. If you want to, you get a porch light on or something like that. That's fine and dandy. So that would be my concerns. Safety would be the most part, as everybody else has said about the road. Uh, definitely DOT. That farm road supposedly is DOT property. Uh, that could be another option to go into if they could talk to DOT and get their requirements, uh, a, a different entryway to that property, uh, which all goes side by side and goes right down to his his actual home. 
Uh, besides that, that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. And Mr. David Ray. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, my name is David Ray. I'm an attorney here in Wilmington, and uh, I'm, I represent Sea Green LLC, which owns about five to six hundred acres in the Sidbury Road vicinity that is dedicated to conservation and preservation of natural habitat. And so my client is a con conservationist, not a developer, with everything that's been going on in the Sidbury Road area over the last couple of years and the explosion of development. You know, we are always interested in hearing what is going on. Um, personally, not very familiar with the RV park concept, and so really came here tonight just to kind of listen, to gather some information. Uh, Mr. Nichols has answered some of the questions I had, and it sounds to me as if the board uh, has identified issues of stormwater runoff. Other neighbors have talked about traffic, and so I really don't have anything further to add, but I uh, just want to thank you for your consideration and appreciate the uh, information everybody's providing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. As, since this is a preliminary forum, we have a little different um, layout, applicant response. Really, Mr. Nichols, do you have any, do you, would you like to, a response period? It doesn't have a time frame, but do you feel like you've digested or do you, do you want to speak any further? I'll say a few things. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know um, I'm glad to answer any questions the board may have in response to the public comment, for one. Um, a few of the specific ones, as I mentioned earlier, we're certainly willing to work with Mr. Hudson on the fence. That's no problem. We can, we can, I'm confident we could work on a design that would be acceptable to him. Um, I think, um, I think that was probably the specific comment that I might be able to address as far as the other comments about traffic and things like that. I mean, um, I would just note again that this is a less of a traffic impact than probably what you'd see if Mr. Grant sold his 22 acres, um, which is, again, in a great location. And there is a lot of development that is happening on, in Sidbury Road for good reason. It's a very nice location. Um, but he doesn't want to do that. Again, he's owned the property for 10 years. He would like to do something uh, different and special with his property and, may, and operate the RV park. And so um, we're, we're glad to continue to talk with the neighbors. Like I said, we had a community meeting. I don't think it was required, but we still had one. We met the, within the 500 feet and everything. And we're, content, we're, we're glad to continue to meet with the neighbors. Um, the, I did want to note that if it's possible, um, to have, when this does go to the county commissioners, to have it not in September, but have it in October. Um, and part of the reason is because of the Labor Day holiday that the New Hanover County commissioners are meeting on the same day as the city council, which doesn't happen at, at all, uh, very often, but it it's, uh, creates a, a conflict. That will actually give us more time to work through some of the plan and again, have some discussions with staff and the neighbors. So I think that's the October 2nd meeting if that's possible to request that in advance. Um, I think the additional time would be beneficial too. Um, I think that's all I had to say. Mr. Nichols, I think as you heard a lot of the, the, the traffic questions, I think if you would, um, not here, but maybe at, at the commission, yes, sir. outline the requirements that you are gonna have to go through if you get approval through yes, the- sir the TRC, that, that there is a driveway permit review that looks at geometry, that looks at, at the approach and all of those things that, that you have to navigate. Um, just, I think, to outline the, the stormwater process um, that you're going to review, the, the, how the septics get, gets approved, and um, 
the commissioners, some of the commissioners may not be aware of, uh, you know, we don't see a lot of septic. We, we don't like septic. Um, right. You've already heard that. Um, but how that gets approved and, and the process, the review process, um, I think outlining that would, would probably be beneficial as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, 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 Mr. Chair, yes, uh, Mr. I, I just want to make a few comments in, in particular related to uh, what we heard from some of the neighbors. Uh, just to reinforce um, the process, the special use process, um, it is a what they call a quasi-judicial uh, process and uh, the people who speak in opposition or, or, or for have to have a level of standing. And so it it's important that as y'all, as the neighbors address these concerns, that they address them with facts and figures, uh, not just "I don't like this" or "or I think that's ugly." Uh, it needs to it needs it needs to have some some uh, real testimony to it. Um, and and I th I think there's some things you can you can mention uh, the, the 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 use of the horse farm when we when when the ordinance was written related to buffer yards and setbacks and fences uh it, they probably weren't anticipating uh horse farms they were probably anticipating neighbors you know neighbors next to a commercial use so there there's some legitimate concerns i think but uh, to just say it might upset the horses is probably not going to be uh way very heavily you need real information about how that type of use might affect the business that is next door, which is the, the, the ranch. So that, that's just the process that you're going to go through. Um, regarding the traffic, I, DOT is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, require that they design an access that is adequate for the RV use. I would, I would say that the, the ranch has been there, and they're pulling trailers in and out. So it's obviously it can be done. Um, but the improvements that this property is going to have to go through are probably going to be much greater than what the farm is because they will have to go through the whole permitting process. So uh, it's, it's a different process than what you saw here tonight. You, you got to see two other applications come through. That was a different process. That was a process where people could talk about their desires and the, 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 what they feel like is an impact to them. The special use process requires uh, um, a higher level of, of testimony. So I just want to make sure that y'all understand that that's, that's what you uh, need to provide at, your, at, at the meeting with uh, county commissioners. And, and to piggyback off that, and thank you, Mr. Hip. I'd almost like to have staff explain what, what standing is I, I, one more time, just so anyone in opposition that wants to speak at the commissioner's meeting, because it will be a quasi-judicial, you'll be sworn in, um, explain that, um, what standing means, and, and who would be allowed to speak. So, so Mr. Petroff, I'll, I'll let our attorney okay. give the more detailed answer. I will say that one of the things with standing is that it would be determined by the Board of Commissioners at the meeting. Um, so it's not something that's as easy as saying, yes, you have it, or no, you don't. But Ms. Richards can provide some information on what would be considered in determining that. Thank you, Ms. Roth. So standing could be you are a property owner. You can talk about your property. You can't talk about the neighbor's property and the impact of that. You're considered an expert if it's your own property. If you um, want to talk about the safety of the roads, then you would probably want an expert that would be able to explain the safety of the roads. Same thing for storm waters. No one would be considered an expert in that area that would have standing, even though you live there and you're concerned with the roads or storm water, you would have to have someone that can say more than just, I'm concerned. You have to have those factual information as to why this might be dangerous, why this might be inappropriate with um, or appropriate for storm water. So as to your own property and what happens on that acreage, that's, you have standing to that, but not to anything else outside of those boundaries. And is that an adjacent property only, or is there a radius? It, it's usually adjacent property. That's where it gets kind of fuzzy. There's not um, a, like a footage that says if you have standing. 
Um, but it is very different for SUPs. You must have some sort of direct input to it. Or is it, could they also have legal counsel speak? Absolutely. Okay. A lot of times they can retain counsel. Counsel can go ahead and work through that process for them. And they can do it as an aggregate. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, any other board comments or, or staff? Any, anything else to weigh in on that process? If we haven't confused it any more than it already is. Mr. Chair. Well, if you could uh, just as the final, uh, if we're yes. at that stage of the meeting yes. for the, <laughs> the next steps conversation. Uh, so following this meeting, uh, this application will go to the Board of Commissioners. I guess we'll need to have the discussion about September and October um, for a quasi-judicial hearing. Each side will have 15 minutes total with an additional five minutes each for rebuttal. And uh, we already touched on this for a little bit, but um, reminder, because this is a quasi-judicial hearing, public comments cannot be submitted ahead of the hearing. Any evidence related to this case must be presented in person at the hearing and must be based on uh, factual evidence as uh, we kind of covered earlier. Um, planning staff, we will be posting the staff report and supporting materials that will be sent to the Board of Commissioners on the county's development activity page beginning tomorrow for public review. Um, but that All right. Well, thank you very much. I think that would will close the preliminary forum and, and but relay that Ms. Roth, how how will we put out the information on when this is going to the commissioners if, if the applicant's asking instead of the September 5th to push it to October, how will that information be disseminated? So the, the advertising for the Board of Commissioners meeting is very similar to what happened for tonight's meeting. Those of you who live in a certain radius of the property will receive a direct mailing. Um, we will have a legal ad in the newspaper. Um, and if you go to the county's website, there's an option to sign up for emails from our department about all of the items that are going to public hearings. If you have any questions about how to do that, you can hang around after the meeting and we can describe it to you or you can give us a call at our office and we'll describe how to get signed up for those emails. Um, if it is going to the October 2nd Board of Commissioners meeting, and that is the date for that, um, then you would likely um, be receiving mail about two weeks ahead of time. And at that point, you should also see some signage along the road alerting you to the fact that there's going to be a public hearing. All right, thank you very much. So, so we've closed the um, preliminary forum. Appreciate everyone coming out for that. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Um, moving along, any staff updates, Ms. Roth? Um, the only thing that I will mention is that um, we are getting close to finalizing the agenda for your joint work session with the Board of Commissioners on August 29th. It looks like that meeting um, will need to go to about 1230. Um, so we'll be sending you an updated invitation as well as the agenda for that, um, most likely tomorrow or early next week. All right. Thank you very much. And I will note I, I failed to um, recognize um, Mr. Cameron Moore coming onto the board. I, I skipped over that at the beginning of the meeting. Welcome. It's good to have you here. And um, with that, I, I get a, take a motion for adjournment. A motion to adjourn and I second. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All in favor say aye. aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>